We are starting. I'm going to wait for the big thumbs up from the chat room to let us know that we are live and that we are ready to go. Oh, yeah, it looks as though we are live. So we are starting the show in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 744, recorded on Wednesday, October 23rd, 2019. Don't fear the AI. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we will fill your head with a claim, a crisis, and a new record. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. One of the fundamental rules of defining a human is this. Humans are humans, and anything that is not a human is not human. Seems simple enough, and yet one of the fundamental tendencies humans have is to humanize anything that is not human. And yet, clocks do not really have faces. And when apes show emotions, why, they might be appearing to be human emotions, but it could just as well be that humans are experiencing ape emotions all the time. Somewhere in the in-between, there are truths that may not be comfortable a face can at times just be a facade that displays information. An emotion can be separated from social context and universal across many species. And while there is no doubt humans have the ability to be intelligent, there is increasing evidence that we are not alone in this. And what is the one thing intelligent creatures of all sorts have in common? They all have a never ending thirst for more This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. Good science to you, Keegan Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin Blair and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back to talk about all of the amazing science that has happened. And I know there are a bunch of scientists out at the Society for Neuroscience meeting this week. I hope you all are having a very brainy time full of stimulation so to speak. We don't have that many brain stories, but we are talking about intelligence on the show tonight, artificial intelligence with Dr. Melanie Mitchell, and we're looking forward to that interview coming up. I also brought stories. What stories did I bring? I have stories about gene editing, a new method, and about a claim from Google about quantum computing. Oh, and elbows. Those are my stories. Wow, you got a lot packed into this show. Uh, I brought the, the simple things, a cosmological crisis that uh, make, uh, puts the standard model in doubt, question mark, probably not really, and uh, plants, I which love is, plants. is exciting by itself. It is. Plants are one of the best things about this planet. Blair, what's in the animal corner? Oh, my goodness. I have smart crabs. Fast ants mm -hmm. and gregarious sharks. Gregarious I, sharks. I, my favorite kind of shark. Right. I'm just thinking <sighs> I've never really considered sharks gregarious before. Well, so I'm looking forward you to this will. One. You just haven't met enough sharks. <laughs> I haven't Never. met the right sharks, obviously. <laughs> yeah. As we're jumping into the show, everyone, I would love to remind you that if you have not yet subscribed to the podcast, it is available all places podcasts are found. Stitcher, Spreaker, Pandora, Radio.com, TuneIn, also on YouTube and Facebook, iTunes, Google, all the places. You can look for This Week in Science. You can also find information at twist.org. And now it is time for our interview. I'd love to in introduce our guest tonight, Dr. Melanie Mitchell. She is professor of computer science at Portland State University and external professor and co-chair of the science board at the Santa Fe Institute. She attended Brown University, 
where she majored in mathematics and did research in astronomy, and the University of Michigan, where she got her PhD in computer science. And her newest book is called Artificial Intelligence, A Guide for Thinking Humans. And I like to think that our audience is full of thinking humans. Welcome to the show, Melanie. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Oh, thanks. I'm glad to be here. I, I'm just going to start off with the big question right off the top, because I know it's at the top of Blair's mind for sure. <laughs> Do we have to worry about the scary killer AI anytime soon? Is this, a, is this something we need to worry about? No. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> um, I think what we have to worry about is more that AI is not smart enough, that it's really too stupid. Uh, there's a great quote from in my book from uh, Pedro Domingos, who is a, a AI researcher, who said that uh, you know we don't have to worry about machines being too smart and taking over the world. It's that they're too stupid and they've already taken over the world. <laughs> hmm. And oh, that and that then that's kind of a letdown if they're already <laughs> <laughs> just not quite enough well, to do we it. Can't live without them, right? But they're yeah. they're still not very smart. Right. I mean, the, the AI that I think most people are familiar with in their everyday lives at this point in time, we've got Alexa and Siri and OK Google. And um, there's but there's AI that is it, it's it's becoming more and more prevalent. I, I'd, I'd love to know what we actually mean by AI. What is artificial intelligence when we say these words? Good question. So different people actually have different definitions. And I go through a few of those in my book. But uh, I, I would say generally people mean programming computers or getting computers to exhibit behavior that we consider in requires intelligence. Of course, we humans aren't totally sure what behaviors in require intelligence. We used to think mm -hmm. that playing chess at a grandmaster level was the pinnacle of human intelligence. But then we found out that it's not that hard to make machines do that. And then that now seems to be less sort of a de definition of intelligence. So um, I think that the, the definition of AI keeps changing mm. with, and part of the reason is that intelligence is such a ill understood phenomenon that AI programming computers to make us and to make them uh, more intelligent helps us understand better what we mean by intelligence or what we don't mean. Yeah, I mean, we talk every once in a while about intelligence tests. And, uh, you know, if we can't even come up with proper intelligence tests for humans, how would we be able to define that and test it in computers? Exactly. And intelligence isn't just one thing. It's not one dimensional. There's social intelligence, there's uh, you know, cognitive intelligence, there's mm -hmm. all kinds of different aspects of being intelligent. And uh, it's not clear that it, I, I think it's one of those words that is kind of a placeholder for things we don't yet understand, but um, once, we be, we're, once we understand things better, we'll be able to replace it with a better set of words. Right. Uh, in the book, I think you use uh, somebody else's word as a, a suitcase word, where it's just a <laughs> word that has... Yeah. Martin Minsky, one of the AI pioneers, called intelligence and other words like consciousness, suitcase words, meaning that they are stuffed, they're like a suitcase, stuffed full of different definitions. Right. And, so, and they... Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, it's, it's, uh, it, it's definitely um, caused... Uh, some confusion among the public and among AI researchers themselves as to what exactly it is we're just trying to study what counts as AI, what doesn't count as AI. And it's a, a kind of a moving target. So I always assumed that AI, the difference between AI and just like a really good computer program was that it learned. No, uh, in fact, in the beginning, uh, AI really didn't use learning very much. It was based on logic and programming mm. computers to do things like uh, do logical deductions. Mm. Only more recently has machine learning become very big and kind of taken over the field. 
So uh, I think of machine learning as more of a subset of AI. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the news that we we talk about now is this is machine learning and not just machine learning, but uh, the deep learning where you have these massive data sets that uh, that the programs are given access to and then they mm -hmm. they make they make connections somehow right, <laughs> right. so deep learning just uh, it is a sort of brain inspired approach to machine learning where you you have what's called a neural network which consists of simulated neurons that have connections to one another and when the system is given some like a photograph or something that a human has labeled as a dog, then the system's supposed to predict that, that, that it's a dog or that it's more likely to be a dog than a cat. And if it's wrong, the connections between neurons get changed, sort of like they do in the brain. Although there's a lot of, uh, if there's any neuroscientists listening to this, uh, they'd probably be horrified <laughs> to hear the, a computer scientist say, say this, but um, it's inspired by the brain. And so these systems change their connections strengths. You know, it's now it mostly software rather than hardware. Um, and they learn from lots of examples to do things like recognize uh, dogs and images. Yeah, so, so but isn't the, yeah, the initial problem is that you show it a picture of the dog and you tell it that this is a dog. And from there on uh, out, it only recognizes golden retrievers as dogs. And any other dog you show it, it's still not a dog until you remind it. No, that even though it's a different breed and it's a different color and it has a different length of snout to eye ratio, it's still a dog if it's a pug or if it's a, if it's a black lab or something else. You have to keep informing it at some point until it kind of gets uh, a broad picture of what dog is. That's right. That's why these networks need huge data sets to learn from you know, millions and millions of photographs in order to learn the, these, to, to recognize these kinds of categories. Um, and that's one way they're different from humans in that like uh, little kids can learn categories with much fewer examples. And um, there's a lot of discussion as to why that is and how we can make machines learn from fewer examples. So that's one of the biggest open problems in AI right now. Yeah, I wonder uh, if by looking at, uh, you know, it, since this is obviously that it, there's a lot of the the parallels where it's we're we're studying intelligence and what how the brain is how it functions and how it's built, right? How, what what how the neurons connect to each other and how they allow cognition to occur, and then modeling that in a computer system. How can we how can we synthesize it, so to speak, and. I'm I'm wondering if we we're really just looking at humans, but are do you know if uh, if researchers are also looking at at other animals and the examples of learning and the ways that other brains learn to see, you know, how these different models of biological wet matter can be can be all put together to make the artificial. Right. No. I mean th that's it's not always the same in all brains, right? But mm -hmm. um, in fact. The deep neural networks today are based on research, brain research that was actually done in cats to uh, mm -hmm. look at how the cat visual system worked. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that cat cats have a visual system that's somewhat similar to humans. So it, it's thought that some of the same things apply. Um, yeah. I, mm -hmm. Go ahead. I just I just be very hesitant to use a uh, a, a solitary hunter a non-social animal that is a solitary hunter as the basis for anything in AI. That just, that's, that's one creature I would have won. It's one, of, it's one of the few, few creatures that doesn't have a sort of built-in mechanism for reconciliation. Uh, Cause they don't need it. They don't ever have to make up and be friends with other cats again. Sure they do. No, you, no, they this don't. Is no, your, wild cat, they, in this the is wild, Justin's anti-cat bias it is showing not up an again. Cat bias. This is a true thing. This is research <laughs> is done on this. Whereas almost every other kind of animal has some sort of built-in method for saying, hey, we were arguing. Let's, let's, uh, let's make up. I'm putting out my hand. I'm 
I'm uh, snuggling my feathers up close to you, whatever that is. They have a sort of signals of like, hey, let's fix this problem. Cats don't, but that's a problem. Right. Advice. Well, AI is nowhere near that. <laughs> yeah. It's still right. looking at like, how, how, does, how do you go from the retina, light falling on the retina to saying the word dog or cat, right? <laughs> It's not looking at how how I can, you know, a cat or a dog can make up with another cat or dog. <laughs> Although, you know, that's a really important, that whole social aspect. But um, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm just saying that deep neural networks are really inspired by, uh, they've largely been inspired by the visual system, but applied in many different areas. What's your, what's your, uh, what's closest to your heart? What do you, what do you love looking at and working on personally? Um, so what's closest to my heart is the topic of analogy. So this is what I did my PhD dissertation mm -hmm. on. And the question is, you know, we make analogies all the time. We, we see some kind of situation and say, oh yeah, I, that reminds me of another situation, you know? You you tell me that you um, you flew to you flew to Austin and and they lost your luggage and I say the same thing happened to me, but I'm actually talking about a bus ride I took to uh, San Diego and uh, they lost you know some part of my luggage or something. But it, you know it's we we just see similarity all the time and that's really I think one of the foundations of how we think about the world. So uh, my work is really focusing on how do we get the concepts into a machine so that it could see those kinds of similarities. So that's what's dearest to my heart. But it's a hard problem, and um, you know, it's I think it's still in its infancy in 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 AI. Absolutely, that, I mean, it, that would be sort of fun question. though if you were interacting with uh, an AI help desk. And you like typed in your problem and it was and it shot back. Yeah, you're up a creek without a paddle. Like, <laughs> that's what brought me here. Yes. It's honest, right? It's very honest. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just imagining because there's the I the analogy issue, it it probably brings in all sorts of aspects of context or depending on what the situation is versus there's all then there's also just things being like each other and everyone who's taken standardized tests knows this is like this as this other thing is to and you have to fill in the blank and right and, and are these the kinds of questions that you that you try and train a, a, a computer program on um so i've worked on things like how is this particular visual situation like another visual situation? Like how is uh, walking a dog more like uh, walking a cat or uh, running with a dog on a bicycle or things like that, you know, more in, in the area of, of visual data. Now, most people, you're right, think about analogy in terms of A is to B and C is to D, you know, foot mm -hmm. is to shoe as, hand is to blank right because we all have done those but it analogy goes much deeper it's kind of like what you mentioned like you know you're up up a creek without a paddle that's like a idiom or a metaphor if you like right. and we our language is just filled with metaphors it, it they're everywhere we don't even notice them a lot of the time and a lot of people in cognitive science think that metaphor is really the, how we think it's it's just it's at the core of everything that we do. You know, we say things like, you know, he gave me a warm welcome. And that's like a physical metaphor because I'm talking about temperature. You know, it's not like the temperature actually went up, but we actually think of it very much in a physical way. So metaphor and analogy are so foundational that we don't even notice them half the time, you know. Uh, and so I think that getting computers to recognize and understand metaphors and analogies would go a lot of the way towards making them smarter and uh, more robust. 
Then there's the question, though. So once again, coming back to the idea of how the brain works and how we actually are thinking of these things. And there's the idea of the artificial intelligence system giving us some insight into how our brains work. But is it still possible that the artificially intelligent systems can develop in a way that we they they act similarly to our brains? There's a similar output, but internally the computation is totally different that it just doesn't match the way that our brains work at all yeah in fact that's what happens i mean that's where we are now because even though the deep neural networks are inspired by the brain they actually work very differently from the brain uh, all of the information in these neural networks uh is what's called feed forward meaning that it goes from one layer forward to another layer, forward to another layer, up to some output. So it, it would be like, it, it's like information comes into your eye, it goes to the retina, it goes to the first layers of the visual cortex and up through to your, you know, more frontal cortex. But in the brain, that's actually not what happens at all. There's all kinds of feedback. And that feedback right. is in a way what, ha what gives us the ability to deal with context and expectation. And that's something that has been very difficult to model using neural networks. Um, people have started working on it, um, but getting this kind of, the kind of feedback that we have in the brain is something that's mostly missing from all of the AI that we use today. I'm imagining an AI Blair running outside, uh, arms outstretched, hearing that it's raining cats and dogs. <laughs> 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 right. Trying to trying to catch those cats and dogs. Yeah. That's yes. the dream. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so in our in our chat room on YouTube, David De Silva has a question that I was curious about as well. Uh, there are some limitations to AI as you know, the computing power, processing power that we're able to use. This week there's been a lot of talk about quantum computing. Do you think quantum computing is going to revolutionize AI? It's possible. I think there's a lot of talk about it. I, you know, one problem with quantum computing right now is that it only, there's only a limited number of algorithms that it actually improves uh, upon co compared with classical computing. Um, and uh, some of them are relevant to AI, but but I don't think there's enough. I think a lot more work has to be done on quantum computing, especially in sort of the, the, the algorithm area, before it will be that relevant to AI. But it's possible that it might revolutionize AI. Yeah, I, I keep kind of trying to trying to visualize the that that I guess the the Schrodinger's aspect of the multiple parallel like multiple instances of a, of a of the answer to a problem being held at once and how that would allow that more rapid um i guess a a, a speedier intelligence more than anything yeah i, I mean it, it, there are some problems in which quantum uh, approaches are much faster than than classical approaches but they require that you set you set up the problem very carefully and uh, that it has some kind of clear objective, like, you know, factor this number. Um, and the problem with that in AI is that a lot of problems in AI don't have a clear objective, it's, or it's hard to state a clear objective, right? to structure the problems exactly so that quantum approach would work well. So I think that there might be some less uh, rigid quantum algorithms that would really help AI, but, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see. What is your what? Is, what are you most excited about? Like in in the book, you you talked about AlphaGo, and you talk about some of the big, uh, the big projects that are ongoing in uh, artificial intelligence research currently. But what do, what do you what gets what what do you think is the most exciting and maybe the most promising? Uh, I, there's a lot of things. You know, there's some work on. There's a lot of work on what's called unsupervised learning. That's where you, you have systems that don't require a human to label all the examples. Mm -hmm. And it learns 
a little bit more like the way humans learn. There's uh, approaches like active learning, where the system itself decides what it wants to learn, and it uses it uses some something akin to curiosity. Um, I think a lot of these approaches are really interesting and could could go somewhere. Uh, another thing that I'm excited about is uh, trying to introduce this notion of causality. So this is something that just seems so obvious to us, like one event causes another. If I drop something, it will fall, and that's caused by gravity. Or, you know, if I um, go over and, and, and uh, uh, throw, throw a tomato at you, the tomato will splat on your face because that's the way the world works. <laughs> and, and there's sort of a cause and effect. But that's not built into computers. You know, machines don't always, they, they don't necessarily have any models that, that take into account causality. So that's something that people are working on that's, that I think is really important. And um, there's some really promising approaches to that. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can imagine. What do you think uh, the biggest limitations are? I've heard a lot of people talk about, um, what is it, the, the brittleness of artificial intelligence, um, um, but can you can you can you talk about what you think are the biggest limitations? Yeah, so brittleness, uh, meaning that the system, if it's trained on one set of data, it sometimes these systems have a lot of trouble generalizing what they've learned to data that's not exactly similar to what they've been trained on. So here's one really striking example of that that I talk about in the book. Um, some of some of the um, the audience may may know about the Deep Mind uh, work on Atari video games. So in this work, um, uh, machines were uh, learned using something called reinforcement learning to play a, old Atari video games. Uh, things like uh, Breakout, where you have a, a little you're using a joystick to move a paddle that, that, that has a ball that's bouncing off of bricks and so on. And it learned to play this game at a superhuman level, did much better than the human game player they compared it with. Okay, so, and this is all like, a you know, it's a video game, it's on a screen. So a, a, a group, another group sh showed that if you move the paddle up by a couple of pixels, something that wouldn't affect a human player at all, the machine could no longer play the game because it hadn't learned the concept of a paddle, sort of the, 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 the it couldn't transfer what it had learned to this very similar version of the game because it hadn't really learned the important concepts. So they just, this knew, idea, it, they just knew that one very specific instance. Yeah. Wow. So, that so it looked this, at it and went, I've never seen this before. Yeah. Said, I don't know what this is. Wow. <laughs> this is something completely new. And um, so there's this area called transfer learning, which me means trying to get AI systems to tra transfer what they learn to some new situation. And, you know, to humans, that sounds ridiculous because, like, learning is transfer learning. That's what we mean by learning. <laughs> so, what these, what machine learning means isn't really the same as what we usually think of the term learning to me, or at least uh, it doesn't yet. So that's one of the big open problems in AI is this kind of transfer learning, generalization, abstraction, you know, has many different names. Yeah, how do you go from that very specific instance to a general intelligence, right? How do you, how do you? Right. Yeah, I got into a conversation based on a, a story that we covered recently to do with artificial intelligence. And I made the comment that, well, artificial intelligence is only as smart as its programming allows it to be to a certain extent. And so there's the the environment in which it exists, the limit, the the constraints on that environment, and then the initial programming that goes into it. Um, and someone uh, made the, the comment to me, well, you have programs now that have emergent behavior that comes out of it. And so isn't that, uh, isn't that like a, a generalized intelligence? Isn't that a, a development of the, the intelligence? Well, 
it depends what you mean by emergent behavior. You know, emergent behavior can be very non-intelligent. Mm -hmm. Of course, intelligence it, in us and in, in living systems, it is an emergent property of our, our brains, right? Our, our individual neurons aren't individually intelligent, but collectively they produce this thing we call intelligence. So there is, you know, emergence, emergence is an important concept, but um, it doesn't necessarily, it's not sort of sufficient for intelligence. And I think, you know, what you said, um, intelligence depends on the environment, it depends on the initial programming, it also depends on, you know, well, the, ex the sort of experience of the uh, system, the data it's mm -hmm. given or, or, right. or yeah. Um, and one of the things that, that, that we haven't quite figured out how to do is to figure out what should that initial programming be. And that's something that people are now looking at to developmental psychology to get some insight. Mm -hmm. So sort of what is innate in babies? They have, they have you know, a, or they learn very early on sort of what we might call intuitive physics, sort of how objects in the world interact with each other. And they they learn sort of an intuitive psychology. They know about human faces, they know about emotions, about facial expressions, and they, they have this sort of basic knowledge that they build on. How do we give that to computers? Yeah, how do you give them something that's not really a blank slate? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it can't be a completely blank slate. <laughs> well, there's been an art, you know, a debate for I probably millennia, but in the AI community, at least for, you know, 40 or 50 years about to what extent should we be looking at blank slates versus programming in innate knowledge? And it just, it's an unending debate. Yeah. Yeah. And not, I mean, and I imagine there's, uh, there are so many uh, coming from the complexity side of your work. I'm sure there are so many possibilities, you know, that at any one starting point, you have a certain number of possibilities, but you can create a variety of different starting points. You can have blank slates that are allowed to evolve and learn however they may. You can have uh, the partially programmed slates where they have not so many <laughs> instructions. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and all of them will end up coming to, to different solutions uh, in the end for different functions and different purposes mm -hmm. yeah do you do you think that the i mean from i guess a theoretical standpoint of artificial intelligence what what do you i mean there are there are there lots of opinions about where ai should end up eventually whether it should be um you know just something that works for us something that works alongside us, something that's more than us? Sure, there, there's, there's all kinds of opinions, uh, as you can imagine. And there's opinions about what AI could do in, in, in practice or, or in theory. You know, could, could we have machines that are actually intelligent, that actually understand things that, you know, that's a debate or, there's a debate about should we develop such machines? Is that ethical? Should we? How do we give these machines some sense of morality? Uh, gosh, there's endless opinions in in the field. Um, so conferences can get kind of fun with these, you know, yeah. debates. People can get pretty, uh, to use a metaphor, hot under the collar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it occurs to me that, yeah, there is a difference uh, that whether you're defining this as an artificial intelligence as a form of calcula uh, uh, you know, very powerful calculation system versus if you're looking at it from an almost artificial life uh, sort of setup. Um, because then, yeah, you would want to uh, pre-program because the pre-programming uh, for, for responses is very much what instinct is. And it's very much in something that all sort of animal life does uh, in order to survive in, in this world uh, versus something that you want to calculate for a set purpose that might not need any of that stuff. Um, but, you know, and I guess but when we're talking about the, the artificial intelligence in machine form, we're talking about still living on a hard drive somewhere or in a server. Right? We're not 
we're not talking about implementing this necessarily to physical machines in the world. No, that's, I mean, think about self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. Those are physical machines in the world and mm -hmm. we want them to assist us. You know, we probably don't want them to have their own consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, but then, yeah. but screw the you, we're going to the mall. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, but, the, but then there's a question sort of how, how far can they get? It's, it's hard to program in rules for driving, for all possible driving situations. So yeah. you want these systems to kind of learn on their own how to drive uh, and figure it out in different situations. But it, one problem is that there's so many possible driving situations that can come up that people are now saying, well, these machines have to have a kind of common sense like we have uh, to deal with situations they haven't encountered. Um, but then if you're going to give them common sense, what does that entail? You know, it's all a big question, open question. Yeah, what is common sense for an artificial intelligence? Uh, over the years, the history of artificial intelligence, uh, there have been what are called the AI winters or kind of these periods of stagnation where there's no funding and people are not as excited about artificial intelligence as they seem to be right now. Um, and right now, it, it's, it appears as though artificial intelligence is experiencing something of a renaissance, a boom with all the tech, you know, advancement of technology is allowing advancement of the software, the hardware, all aspects. Um, do you do you see any indicators anywhere that this is good? This is like the new pace and this is where it's going to stay or do you do you see indicators that there might be another winter on the on the way? I definitely see uh, indicators of a little bit of both. So uh, mm. I do think that AI ha has made more progress in the last ten years, maybe than it's made with all of its existence. You know, there we have all these products now that work quite well in certain circumstances, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, ha we have, uh, as, as you mentioned, we have, we have our virtual assistants like Alexa and Siri, we have Google Translate, we have uh, speech recognition that transcribes our speech. Uh, we have um, GPS navigation, facial recognition, et cetera, et cetera. And these things work quite well in most or many circumstances, they're not perfect. They make errors uh, if they're being used for sort of uh, critical life or death situations. They probably aren't as trustworthy as we would want them to be. Uh, so I think those things, you know, if it were, we use them all the time, they're they're good. Uh, but for things like self-driving cars, we definitely have seen sort of the limitations. We've seen expectations been raised to a huge high level. We're going to have self-driving, we're going to have millions of self-driving cars on the road next year. People have been saying that for several years. Mm -hmm. We still don't have them. Yeah. It's a lot harder than people envisioned. Uh, it may be that we don't have the prompt that what we've been promised, that is true self-driving cars for many decades. I think that's very likely. I think that we're going to adjust what we mean by self-driving and that we're going to um, make the sort of, we're going to change the infrastructure of our roads and our cities to assist these vehicles because they can't deal with the way things are now. So, um, you know, I, I, we'll, we'll have something, but we won't have what <laughs> is promised. And that may, may have some economic impact that, that might be like an AI winter. Mm. It's, 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 it's an interesting one, too, because you, you think of human intelligence as being the thing we're shooting for. Uh, and then, of course, so what a difficult thing it, it would be to make uh, an artificial intelligence that can operate a vehicle better or at least as good as the human when we haven't done so in any other category. But then you look at when <laughs> when driving goes wrong with humans, it's, it's usually because we're being too human. Right. Uh, with our driving, <laughs> and that's actually this other whole aspect of you know we're not necessarily the best model in every scenario no, to be no. replicating. 
So the the, the I, I actually believe the self-driving car has a better shot uh, at, uh, at at succeeding uh, than some because most of the uh, problems with with human driving are very human problems uh, where we've gone outside of of the of of the strict. Uh, the ro- law of the road or programming that we're supposed to stay awake the entire drive, <laughs> eyes open the whole time, daydreaming while driving, looking in the wrong direction. Yeah, texting. Oh. <laughs> yes, texting. It's oh, no. something that even if the AI is texting while driving, they're probably okay with it. It's probably a subroutine that doesn't take away from the vision of the road. Yeah, but I mean, I think our he- our humanness, as you say, yeah, we're, we can be very bad at driving sometimes. Mm-hmm. We're very bad at paying attention, and that makes that that's also a problem for self driving because if we don't, you know, what we have now or what we're going to have soon is what they call, you know, level three autom- autonomy, which which means that this, the the machine the system can drive pretty well most of the time, but in some circumstances the human has to take over. So it's like, you know, uh, the human is supposed to be paying attention while the car is driving itself because just in case something happens that the car can't deal with. Humans cannot do that, right? They can't. They just can't. They're not set up for that. So level three autonomy is just not going to work. Level and they, four. And there, there's yeah. some aspects where they try this already where the car is going to drive and stay within the lanes. Mm-hmm. And it'll it'll slow down with radar, speed up to keep uh, pace with traffic. Yeah. But you have to keep your hands on the wheel, and it can. T- uh, there's sensors that will vibrate the wheel if you've let go. Uh, yeah. for t- but but yeah, you're asking a human then to pay attention without that thing you're paying attention being necessarily relevant to them for long stretches. That's yeah, that's even harder to do. Uh, yeah, than no, just no one make- can do that. No. no one can do that. Even like the the, the people that the self driving companies higher to do that can't do it and that's been the cause of several accidents huh. right so um so it's a problem and and i think that you know the solution is that there there's going to be parts of cities that are set aside to have the right kind of infrastructure and mapping and all that kind of stuff that will make self-driving safe where humans don't have to pay attention and those cars are not going to be able to drive in all parts of the city or in yeah. all weather and there's just going to be a lot of limitations. Yeah, a lot of limitations. But I li- I like your implication that the cities themselves maybe I mean it feels as though cities are on their way to changing anyway. We have a lot of considerations around transit and there are a lot of these human policy considerations that are underway. Um and and so this seems as though it might fit right in there. And if people are talking about it all together, you know, how can these, the artificial intelligence, these self-driving cars be implemented safely within these new plans? Can it work? People, politics, computers, it's going to be a wonderful mix. Yeah. yeah and it's a <laughs> complex problem too. And then you have Very. to worry about like, if there's an accident, who's responsible and all the legal stuff and the insurance yeah, it's, it's it's there's a lot of things to work out. So there's all this conversation about from the environmental side of things that scientists need to stop, you know, staying out of politics and actually get involved because there's so much going on there. But this is the perfect example for this other side of it as well, that when when um, governments are starting to look at infrastructure and science and technology now need to be part of the conversation, they probably should have always been. But now especially, they're really going to need to be part of the conversation. This is another good kind of call to action to have um, scientists and engineers trying to move into that space a little bit, I think. Yeah, I think that they are, and 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 mm-hmm. computer scientists are kind of waking up to their social responsibility, mm-hmm. not just in AI, but in like cybersecurity and and uh, privacy yeah. and all that stuff, um, and uh, getting more involved in in advising about policy and so so forth, but probably not enough. No. <laughs> probably not enough. Like probably there's still probably not, not scientists in charge of certain committees in government related to directly to science. But oh well. <laughs> Baby steps, I suppose. <laughs> Baby yeah. steps. Um 
So tell us a bit more before we we finish the the interview. Your book, you, we've talked about a lot of the subjects that you that you cover in the book, um, but the idea that it's a guide for thinking humans. What is the what is the intent there behind that title? Yeah, it was kind of a, a humorous title because you know we talk about thinking machines. And my book is a guide for thinking humans. It's a guide about thinking machines for thinking humans. And I make kind of a joke in the book about when thinking machines might be allowed to join our discussion. Um, but I do, uh, it's also the idea that the book is, it's, it's meant to be accessible to a broad audience, but it's not like a pop science book that, that is superficial and doesn't really explain what's going on. I try and explain how a lot of these systems actually work. Mm -hmm. So it does take a little bit of thinking to, to read uh, the book and understand what's going on. Um, but I think that's really important if you're going to be evaluating the state of AI and thinking about where machines are to actually understand what are these algorithms that they're mm -hmm. using. So that's something I try and get across. Which is really important now, I, especially there are so many, there's the letter that was signed by 150 scientists or, or people about warning about the future of AI. And there are a lot of public pro proclamations by technologists and others saying that we need to be afraid of artificial intelligence. And it's this, it's it, the hype machine is pushing to the negative side, the negative perceptions for the general public. And really the general public needs to be more educated on what's actually happening in the, in, in the research areas, what is the state of the research right now? Like, what do you really have to be worried about? Right. So that's exactly why I wrote the book. Uh, you know, I myself was a little confused about what the state of the research was. And there was, yeah. there's a lot of disagreement about what, <laughs> how to interpret the state of the research. So I tried to, I spent three years kind of researching myself, what, what's going on in all these different areas and trying to explain it. Um, and I hope that uh, people can get a kind of a good picture of what the current state of AI is. You know, it's constantly changing, but I think it's, you know, certain things change quickly and certain things change slowly. So I tried right. to capture both of those. Yeah, I think you, I think I, I think it's a it's a wonderful book, and you you capture you captured my attention right off the bat with the very personal introduction of kind of how you started coming into these questions with a meeting at Google with some of these big minds. Um, and then also talking about, I think it's very fascinating, you bring up um, your your graduate advisor, Hofstadter's, um, he, his fear mm -hmm. of his, his, his feelings on it and how fascinating that he, your advisor, was so uh, concerned. Yeah. And it, it, it's kind of surprised me how concerned he was and um, yeah. how he was concerned not for the reason that he was worried that, you know, robots are going to take over the world, but more that intelligence was going to be achieved in computers by what he called cheap tricks. <laughs> kind of like the, the, the big data statistical approaches that we use now that um, would sort of capture all the things that he felt were the most human things about us. And he didn't want them to be captured by cheap tricks. Hmm. So yeah. that was kind of his uh, his worry. Yeah, I mean, there are those artificial intelligence programs for music, for art, for writing, writing science articles, writing sports mm -hmm. articles. There, there's there are all sorts of all, all sorts of programs out there now that are doing amazing things. But yeah, to date. They are cheap tricks, and they are identifiable for the most part, I think. There are those few that kind of stand out, but um, that there is that the heart of human creativity that has... Oh, my internet is causing trouble, maybe. Mm -mm. I don't think it's yours. Oh. Uh, so so there is, there's like, yeah, we, if we have a yeah. painting made by an algorithm that's designed to uh be admired by the most people it'll have it'll be a landscape with uh some friendly forest animals and then a famous person 
Uh, it would just be this horrible, horrible thing. So <laughs> we don't I'm necessarily. Moving. Oh, I'm moving <laughs> closer to my router nice. because <laughs> my internet kind of gave out. <laughs> it's a, it's the roving computer scientist interview. Yeah. Yes, taking a tour of my house. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I was just gonna. I was. We were just saying that uh, creativity has yet to really be touched by artificial intelligence. That's. Oh, some people would disagree with you. Yeah, because I mean, they wrote been... that really weird, uncanny um, movie script, right? Yeah, and and it's created like uh, visual images that people have called very creative and and um, creepy. <laughs> sometimes very creepy. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's another thing people disagree with is sort of what is creativity? That's another one of those suitcase words. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Things. Okay. What is holding art? it all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't want to keep you too much later, but I did want to know for the uh, the last sentence in your book. Your book has just been released um, and is is out now. But uh, I would love to know if any AI have responded to the question that you ask in the last <laughs> sentence of your book yet. Not yet. <laughs> I'm still waiting. Okay. <laughs> Now we have to read it. Yeah. Now you have to read it. Yes. Yeah. The tease. And, and I hope, so, I mean, there's a part of it where it would be a, a fantastic piece of news to hear that you had heard from an AI that had answered the question. I'm just waiting question, for an AI but... to review the book and tell me how it liked it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any uh, anything as far as what you'd love our listeners to take home with them? before we uh, before we close out for the interview um wow uh i think we've covered quite a bit and mm -hmm. i hope that people will take a look at the book i i'm very excited for people to read it and uh let me know what they think mm -hmm. and computers to read it and let me know what they think too yeah <laughs> absolutely um and where can people find you and follow you online is there a place where they can uh where they can find out more yeah so uh, my website which is melanie mitchell.me and uh, my twitter which is mel mel mitchell one mel mitchell one all right so we can follow you on twitter and find out all sorts of fun computer science and uh, artificial intelligence news and follow the field. And we can, uh, if you want, you can find information about her book, about uh, about all sorts of wonderful things at the website. Dr. Mitchell, thank you so much for joining us on the show tonight. Oh, it's been great. Thanks a lot for having me. It's been absolutely wonderful. Really appreciate your time. And thank you once again for writing this book. I hope uh, people do take a look at it. It was, I'm, I'm enjoying it a lot. Artificial Intelligence, a Guide for Thinking Humans. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful night. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, everybody. It is time for us to take a break. Us thinking humans, we need to take a rest for a moment. But we will be back with lots of science for some amazing thoughts in just a minute with as soon as I can get past the password protection on my laptop <laughs> so I can get back into the into the music. <sighs> we'll be back in just a few more moments with more This Week in Science. Stay tuned. <laughs> Explain things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way to go. A new conclusion. The methods are hypothesis and patience are the only things I Thank you for watching, listening to This Week in Science, being a part of the fun that is This Week in Science. I hope you enjoyed the interview that we just had with Melanie Mitchell. While we are here for a moment, I would love to ask 
for a little bit of your support. This Week in Science is listener-supported at this point in time. And to maintain that listener support, we do need to get your help to make sure we can keep doing that, doing the show week in, week out, the way that we do. And one thing you can do to support us is go to twist.org and click on the calendar link. Pre-order. Oops, pre-order a calendar. Uh, We have... Blair has finished the art for the TWIS 2020 Blair's Animal Corner calendar, and it will be available very soon. It's open for pre-order right now. You go to twist.org, click on the... It's a frog, Blair? It's a frog, not a toad. That's a horned frog. It's a horned frog, once again. It's a horned frog, and click on the frog image for the calendar, and you can pre-order your calendar, and pre-ordering the calendar, we will send you one when we have them in. Get your calendar now for 2020. It will be it will be great for you to have a calendar to enjoy throughout the year that has amazing art by Blair. Look at all this wonderful stained glass theme art. And it has dates of important and interesting scientific celebrations throughout the year. So you can always stay on top of really cool celebrations. Like today, it's Mole Day. Happy Mole Mole Day. Day. I hope everyone had some guacamole. Guacamole. Mole Day is full of avogadros. (laughs) No, I just went and dug holes in my backyard. But, um, mole holes? Mole holes. Looking for go. moles. Yes, this calendar is almost ready to print. We just have to decide on some um, twist events. And I have to check all the animal special events since they, some of them move, which is just annoying. And then it'll be ready to go. It'll be ready to go very soon. So twist.org, pre-order your calendar now so that we can send you one before the holidays. Get yours before the holidays, before the end of the year. Make your plans for next year on a 2020 Blair's Animal Corner calendar. Also over at twist.org, remember, you can click the subscribe button that will easily allow you to subscribe to iTunes, Google, or our YouTube channel. And you can check out our Zazzle store or click on the Patreon link to support Twists in an ongoing recurring payment each month at a level of your choosing. $10 or more a month. We thank you by name on the show. Thank you so much for your support. We cannot do this show without you. So we thank you for your support so much. We can't do it without you. It's true. <sighs> Explain the things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way you go. A new conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience. And we're back with more this week in science. We are back, and now. <gasps> It's that time in the show for this week in What Has Science Done For Me? Lately. And you know what? It's empty. I have no more. I have no more from anyone. No, I I have no more. I have none. If I missed yours, let me know. But otherwise, I have none. Wait. Somebody is raising their hand here next to me. Hold on. Oh, uh, Hold on. I think we have a recruit. You have you have something that science has done for you lately? Okay, come here. So, so talk um, into the microphone. What's your name? <laughs> no, no my say name. your name. What's your well, name? Kai. Okay, Kai. Kai. What has science done for you lately? Well, um, well, well, this was a while ago. Doesn't matter. But we what? haven't shared it okay. before. Okay, share it. Um, remember when we got the flowers, but then we figured out that um, cats can die from lilies, I think? Right, lilies are toxic to cats. Oh. Yeah, and um, I would not I, have we guessed bought this. lilies for cats in like, this thing for my mom one day. And um, the cats, like we just found Stella with all these like orange powder on her face and then we figured out it was actually toxic oh no and then we actually had to send her to the vet so then they could actually wash out the stuff so if we didn't 
learn that, then Stella and Cappy would be dead. Even so I learned I learned something very similar about dogs last night. And also, I'm pretty night. sure other stuff was also poisonous that we had as well. Okay, what did you learn, Justin? I, so I learned uh, science is done for me lately. I went to a uh, conference on animal intelligence that was uh, presented by Franz DeWall, who's a researcher. Oh, into... awesome. Yeah. Uh, and I, I found out that <laughs> this is it was a fun story. Um, dogs, who we think are not disgusted by anything, because they will, um, they you know, they sniff other dogs' uh, rear quarters. They will uh, even sometimes eat um, poop. The yeah, lots of animals eat poop. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but dogs are disgusted by citrus uh, because it turns out it's toxic for them. Uh, and and uh, they had a, a, a video demonstration of a dog that licked a citrus. And don't do this at home. There was a disclaimer because it is actually toxic to them. Um, but it had a huge disgust reaction uh, from from licking a lime, I think it was, or something like this. Uh, and so, so yeah, there there are things that are toxic to animals. Also, what is it? Dogs don't uh, can't eat chocolate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, there are things that uh, that that will surprise us uh, in the world in terms of what is a toxic thing and what is something that is not toxic uh, to other life forms. Yeah, mm -hmm. and these are things that science can teach us mm -hmm. that that it figures out. Yes, mm. thank you very much for that, Kai. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you for joining the show. And if anyone out there has a what has science done for me lately to send in, please do send me an email at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com or leave a message on our Facebook page. That's This Week in Science on Facebook. Now go to bed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now it's on to some more science news. What do we have to talk about next? <gasps> Prime editing. You want to talk about some prime editing? Is that like editing that's just at its prime? It's just so crisp and it's perfect. Well, it is better supposedly than other genetic editing. This okay. is prime editing. It's a new tool similar to CRISPR, a new gene editing system that has been developed by the Broad Institute, David Liu's lab, who is also involved, was also involved in a lot of the CRISPR-Cas9 system development over the years. Uh, but he, they've been attempting to develop a more accurate system because there's a problem with CRISPR-Cas9 is that it's not always accurate. When it chops up the DNA, there are errors, and sometimes there's what are called off-target effects, which is that the gene that you want to put into DNA maybe gets put in the wrong places. And so mm -hmm. some, depending on where it's put, it can have some negative, de deleterious effects. Although although I will, I will uh, interject really quickly. There was a big report that was issued recently that I should go find and bring to the show. Gosh, I don't know why I didn't bring it. Um, where, they, where they did illustrate that the viability uh, uh, of those off targets wasn't as big a deal as had been previously reported. Like you would, like the deteriorating effects aren't actually going to be that bad or noticeable uh, if you're right. doing CRISPR in a, in a uh, life form. Like it's not really going to be that bad. There's enough random mutation that takes place within the gene, larger genome that having some off target effects aren't really going to be as negative as we had once feared. But I digress. <laughs> not as negative, but there's still some negative. And so the accuracy is, I mean, if you want to be specific about where you put an edit yes. in our genome, you want a system that's accurate. And CRISPR-Cas9 is just not quite accurate enough for a lot of people's tastes. There have been other developments based on different Cas systems. So there's a Cas12, a CRISPR-Cas12 system that's involved. Um, and uh, a couple of other permutations that have been developed over the years. And there are other gene editing tools like zinc finger nucleases. These are also used to chop into DNA and make edits to the genome. But again, it's the how well does it work? How accurate is it? And each of these tools is potentially useful in, in some 
uses, some situations, but not necessarily all of them. Now, the uh, this new precise editing tool, prime editing, as it is being called, they published in Nature this week uh, about the tool, and it, it, it uses the CAS system. It doesn't use CRISPR. Uh, so it's not the repeated pa- the palindromic repeats of the CRISPR, but it does use the Cas molecule and some other variants to to snip one strand. The and it follows the reason it's called prime editing is that it follows from the three prime to five prime. So if you're looking at the chromosomes, they are labeled based on dif- the ends of the chromosomes as they. The three and the five, they're opposites from each other. So they're they're back, they're kind of flip-flopped to each other. And, and the way that it runs is from three to five, and it's called the prime strand. And it, it goes the DNA editing stuff goes along that prime strand of DNA. And so the editing tool edits this prime the prime strand. And so it nicks it. And just what does what instead of like the CRISPR-Cas9, which cuts both strands of DNA. This new system makes a little nick in in one of the strands, and that allows it to put in the edit that it wants to put in, and then the DNA gets that was was there before gets taken away and cut off, and so now you just have a new sequence that's inserted into the genome on that chromosome, and then it the prime editor nicks the other non-edited side, just one little nick. And it allows the cellular repair machinery to come along and fix it. And when it comes along to fix that little nick in the the second strand, it sees the new sequence of DNA. And so it gets rid of all the unmatching amino acids, all the base pairs that aren't supposed to be there anymore. And so you end, it ends up with the cellular machinery putting in the complementary strand of genetic material. So you're really only inserting half of it. And then the, the cell itself makes the complementary strand. But anyway, it's this, it's supposed to be very accurate and it's supposed to, they're, they are promising or they're estimating that it will be able to be used on some 90% of uh, disease associated d- DNA variants in uh, our database, which is, somewhere around 75,000 variants at this point in time. And and so they're estimating that it could have a real, real huge impact into uh, genetic gene editing therapies down the road for taking these diseases that are genetically based and editing stuff in very accurately. Now, that said, there was a thread on Twitter from a researcher named Jonathan Wild who goes into it a little bit. And he says, OK, OK, this is really cool, but it's also being really hyped up. And the reality of putting stuff into humans and making it work in not even just humans, but living animals is a far cry from having something work in a dish. And their systems and what they tested it on, the cells they looked at in in a dish that they that they worked on it, um, it didn't work really well in neurons. It didn't work really well in cardiac cells, which are cells that might be really important to do editing in. And so um, another another issue is potentially the size of this system is fairly large. And if you're trying to get it past the blood brain barrier, how do they do that? They haven't even talked about that yet at this point. They're just at the very, very early stages of saying, look, we have a new tool. We have to figure out how to actually make it work in stuff. So if it's using, and I don't know the mechanism behind this, but if it's using the, the uh, genetic code or the, the body's machinery, to enact these changes. It makes sense that the, the, there might not be the mechanism available to, to allow a change in a neuron. <laughs> these are very, this is a very conserved, very important system. So perhaps it's the underlying machinery that's just not there, which would also be the machinery that would allow mutation to take place, I would assume. Yeah, so yeah. 
Yeah, the machine and is the machinery going to be there in all the cells? That's exactly right. it. All that's are all the cell types going to be able to do what you want it to do? And they don't know that yet. They haven't tested it in all in all the cell types. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's it's making some assumptions. the The claims that they're making are based on assumptions that are as of yet unproven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's pretty interesting. It's a, a new gene editing system. I just it's I think it just goes to show um, kind of just how fast moving the, the field of genome editing is these days. Things are new, new discoveries, new tools, new molecules. Things are being constantly updated and implemented and it's it's really exciting and also if people have not seen the netflix documentary unnatural selection yet i uh, highly recommend it i watched it this weekend very good series on uh, gene editing um, from the perspective of health from the perspective of environment and also from the perspective of personal like biohacking so people doing stuff for themselves so it takes a lot of different perspectives and it's a a very broad uh documentary that is uh is uh created over four parts there are four hour long um parts to it it's really good highly recommend it gene editing it's big right now it's hot yeah. so hot right now so hot just like quantum computing. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, yeah, we were I'm, just talking about that. Yeah, I, we were talking about it. And this week, Google announced that it has quantum supremacy. What does that mean exactly? It's the quantumist. It's the quantumist. Yes, exactly. Uh, so the definition of quantum supremacy in essence is uh, it, it was originally uh, the concept was originally described by a theoretical physicist named John Preskill and the idea is that it's a situation in which quantum computers outpace conventional computers by achieving some calculation doing something that quantum that that, that conventional computers are completely at a loss for, are unable to do. Where it's like, oh, we can't use a regular computer to do this. Guess we have to use our quantum computers. You know, that's the, the point of quantum supremacy. And so their demonstration that they say is that they, uh, they had their 53 qubit quantum computer uh, do a simulation that took something like 200 milliseconds for it to run. And this is, it's the, their computer's named Sycamore, by the way. Sycamore took two, oh, 200 seconds to repeat a, a certain sampling process to do a, a calculation. And they calculated, they didn't actually run it because I guess they would have thought it would take too long to run, but they calculated that a state-of-the-art supercomputer would have taken 10,000 years to do the same task. And so because their calculation, they're like, yeah, we win, quantum supremacy. Who's going to use a supercomputer when we can do it with a quantum computer in 200 seconds? So, caveat. IBM came out with a... Uh, with an article on the archive and they also came out with a letter, an open blog post uh, to the public about this discovery. And they say, nay, nay, Google is not the most quantum supreme. No, no, no. Nay. Quantum drama. <laughs> it's quantum drama. Yes. Uh, and they say, based on their calculations, which look at other aspects of conventional computing, including data storage, as opposed to just processing power, but also other aspects, they calculate that it would not take 10,000 years and that, they're, that a regular computer could have done this same calculation maybe in like two and a half days, which the quantum computer would still be faster at 200 seconds, but it's not quantum supremacy in this situation because 
you could still use a conventional computer to solve the problem. And they and they actually simulate it and they show in their paper in the archive that, hey, the, a conventional computer can do this in two and a half days. So no quantum supremacy, Google. No. And so it is. Google, uh, you need some ice for that burn. Woo, yeah. <laughs> but it's really an interesting uh, it's it's what it is, is a debate on metrics and it is a debate on um, how, so basically how it is measured and then also errors. And one of the big things of, similar to the gene editing that we were talking about, quantum computing is known to be fairly inaccurate and it has to repeat things a lot because there, there's a lot of um, error inherent in the system. Qubits flip the wrong way all the time. And so the sampling has to be done over and over to get to uh, overcome that that bias, that error that's within the system. Um, and apparently Google's system might not be all that accurate and might have a lot of errors in it. And IBM is saying, ours is more accurate, it's better. And so it's a fight between the accuracy of the system, how well it can do all those pro those processes, those computations. Um, and then also, what do we define as, okay, what is something that a conventional computer can't do? Because at this point, all of the problems that they are putting to quantum computers are still things that conventional computers are totally capable of. Anyway. Hmm. Anyway, it's an interesting debate. It's an interesting point in time where we are. And who knows? I mean, it just means that this race toward quantum supremacy is well underway. And these big corporate behemoths and other uh, technolo technology researchers developing these quantum computers, they are, they're going to keep, be keep work, continue working on this for uh, quite some time. Quantum computers, they are on their way. And then the AI and all the gene editing, and then it'll be the future. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the future was yesterday. <laughs> it was. All right. This is This Week in Science. Justin, what do you have? I have a cosmological crisis. Oh, no. Do you need a therapist? Yeah. Uh huh? <laughs> do you need a therapist? <laughs> no, I need an astronomer. Mm. Uh, cosmologist, at the very least. Uh, astronomers led by the University of California, Davis, has uh, data that suggests the universe is expanding more rapidly than predicted uh, by the standard model. Uh, the team measured, uh, made measurements of the Hubble constant, expansion rate of the universe, and came out with sort of different than expected results. They used NASA's Hubble telescope, uh, space telescope in combination with the Keck Observatory's adaptive optic system to observe three different gravitationally lensed systems. And they did something kind of fun, which you would hope that uh, can, is the way that uh, the science should be done, to rule out any bias of their own so that they weren't looking at the results and going, ah, oh, if it was only different by this or that, or if we factored this, some other unknown factor, and we could come up with the result that we might expect. Instead, uh, they, they did a completely blind analysis. So during the process, they kept the final answer hidden from themselves until they were convinced that they had addressed as many of the possible uh, parameters and potential errors that they could think of. So they made all of their fixes without seeing what the result of the data was. So, that, uh, so then this is the quote from uh, Jeff Chen, who's a graduate student at UC Davis Physics Department. When we thought that we had taken care of all possible problems with the analysis, we unblind the answer with the rule that we have to publish whatever value we find. Even if it's crazy, it's always a tense and exciting moment to get this uh, data. Finally. So they, they did publish and uh, the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. Uh, the unblinding revealed a value that is consistent with the Hubble constant measurements taken from observations of local uh, objects close to Earth. Uh, 
So, which is which is uh, like a, the closest supernova uh, that they can you know, make these uh, analysis of. So you can say, okay, it's consistent. That's great. Except that they were looking at gravitationally gravitationally lensed systems from really far away. So there is a problem because, uh, according to the standard model of cosmology, the universe was expanding very fast in its early history. So when we talk about this constant, we are talking about somewhat localized events. Uh, the further back you go, or the further away a thing is, you should see actually a little bit uh, different lens, uh, uh, shifting than you see close up because there was a fast expansion and it has been slowing down uh, because of dark matter interactions. What they found it actually was consistent. It seems like it's not slowing down at all, that the acceleration uh, of the universe is at least the same, if not going a little quicker than we had expected. So because they're using a sort of new technique and they did all of these blindings, they're going to, of course, do some more looking. But the idea that the value from the local and the distant uh, can be can be the same in theirs, whereas other observations have also found values from local and distant that uh, disagreed. So mm -hmm. there is either problems in the way that we're measuring the the expansion, uh, or there is a problem with the idea of the constant to begin with. Uh, but it's a pretty pretty interesting uh, find. I think this is, we've been talking about this for a while and it, mm -hmm. it, it, it's just fascinating that this continues, that every time people look at it a different way, mm -hmm. it's not making it fit together any better. At first it was, hey, we measured the cosmic microwave background radi radiation and oh, hey, we looked at these supernova things. Mm -hmm. They're not the same. And then somebody else came in a while later and they're like, yeah, our measurement's not the same either, and it's not yeah. close to either one of those, and so we're actually just a weird middle player, and now there's this new measurement that's like, yeah, it's not. they don't match. <laughs> yeah, and, and, it, and it would be just a happenstance if they did, in this case, match, because it looks like they got the same result from the very distant and the close-up, that they were, yeah. the expansion looks the same, which means uh, not that we're accelerating faster in the expansion, but th that yeah. it's the same, that it hasn't slowed down, which mm -hmm. is, a, but there's also been this idea that uh, uh, there was initial expansion, mm -hmm. everything was moving very fast, and then dark matter slowed everything down, and, but then dark energy is speeding things up again. Mm -hmm. so, then, so then are we just happen to be at the same point between these two points where the slowing down and the speeding up has gotten it to the same point? Uh, anyway. It's it's fun to know that in a cosmological scale constant, uh, there's still a lot of inconsistencies. That we, we, know be we, we know nothing. We know nothing. Our materials we, are flawed. Our methods are flawed. No, no constant is constant. Well, we know nothing. Well, that's the thing is we actually know quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, and, and we have quite a bit of data. And the fact that we are finding the inconsistencies in quite a bit of data is really fascinating. I think I think it is fascinating. And is, does it mean that we're going to if we continue to compile evidence in this direction, will the you know dominant ideas about the, you know, the formation of the universe have to be changed? You know, how many how much of the uh, of our conceptualization of our universe mm -hmm. is going to have to switch or, you know, we just have to get more data. It's seriously, we are in flatland. We're like, and yeah, or it's either flatland or it's that the uh, the analogy of the. Oh. We lost her again. We lost her to an analogy. An analogy of the update that kills <laughs> Kiki's computer. Oh, there we go. The analogy. It's like she's up a podcast without a mic. Yeah. Being, being on the air without a being on the air without a mic, hot mic. Come on, come back to us, Gigi. I'm back. Yeah. Yeah. What was your analogy? The analogy of uh, the the blind scientists describing an elephant, ah, where mm -hmm. 
in, or describing an elephant in the dark, exactly, where one person says, oh, well, it's this long and it, it, this aspect and this, well, it's browned and, uh, you know, like somebody's tree describing trunk. a tree trunk. Oh, someone's it's, describing it's the broad, trunk. it's like a big wall of a thing. Yeah. And then somebody else has got the tail and it's like, really? Because I've got like a small little snaky thing. And then the guy at the other end's like feeling the trunk. That's a small snake. This is like a boa constrictor. It's huge. Yep, you've got it. Exactly. So I think we have a lot of, there's, uh, we're describing different parts of things and we need to put them together. Um, but then there's also, you know, the not, not being able to see that the whole picture from where we are yet. And who knows if we ever will, but what, an, an, <laughs> how, how amazing that we have the ability to try. We yeah. ask questions and we want to know more and it's, let's learn more. It's awesome. You know what's also awesome? What? Blair's Animal uh, Corner. With Blair. Oh, thanks. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. and a What you got, Blair? I have some uh, very smart animals, and these animals in particular are crabs. <laughs> uh, Swansea University in the UK took common shore crabs. They're, um, they're also called green crabs. And um, they saw if these crabs could solve a maze. <laughs> so they put them in a specially designed maze um, in order to see how spatial learning and crustaceans work. Um, so that's an important ability in animals that they've studied a lot. A lot of scientists have studied spatial learning in terrestrial animals, but in marine creatures and specifically marine invertebrates, it is pretty difficult to follow those animals around in the real world. And so spatial learning can be complicated to try to study in those individuals. In this study, however, they took 12 crabs and over four weeks, they put them in a maze. There was food at the end of a maze each time. And the route to the maze required five changes in direction and had three dead ends. Over those four weeks, the team saw the crabs show a steady improvement in the time taken to find the food at the end of the maze and the number of wrong turns taken. So they were learning the right way to solve the maze. What really was surprising was that when they waited two weeks after having solved the maze and then plopped them back down in the maze again and didn't put any food down at the other end, they reached the end of the maze in under eight minutes, which to them was a clear sign that they remembered their route. So I think one thing is really important to mention here, and that is that since they didn't put food at the end of the maze, they weren't just following chemical signals. They weren't just sniffing their way to the food. They really did remember the right way to solve the maze. And this is something that we have studied in insects before, so it's actually not that surprising. Crabs and insects are both arthropods. They're actually kind of closely related. So um, the fact that we know that bees and ants can solve mazes and do things like this it's not so surprising, but it does show proof in methodology for a, a maze test for a marine invertebrate like this. And it also um, opens the door to more experiments looking at ocean conditions on crabs, because if we know that they know this spatial awareness and they can learn, um, then that means that we can test them with some more complicated stuff as well. I think this is this is really interesting. I mean, the big thing here, I mean, coming from the earlier conversation about artificial intelligence, coming from questions of different brains and the intelligence that different brains are capable of and demonstrations of that, um, the the big question that that is fascinating to me is how much brain is required to allow this kind of spatial processing and memory. Obviously, mm -hmm. this crustacean invertebrate, basically like a, a glorified insect, yes. has less brain than bees. <laughs> um, it's, it's capable of very, this is a 
fairly complicated task. Navigating yeah, and, and the environment, right? And, and they and learned a lot. Yeah. So these yeah. these crabs that came back two weeks later and were able to solve the maze in under eight minutes, they also took some crabs that had never seen the maze before and plunked them down in the maze. Some of them took almost a full hour to hmm. find the other end, and some of them never found the end oh, of no. the maze in the hour-long study period. <laughs> So it really did prove that having to find their way through this maze, that they really did learn something. And there are individual differences in ability, even in crabs. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> some, some crabs are just a bit quicker than others. Yeah, that it's... I think I think it's interesting. I'd love to hear a lot more about uh, how the, the brains of crabs allow them to navigate like this. Let's learn more about crabs. Yeah, and now we can because we've proved that they can solve a maze and they can remember things. So, um, and they can learn from their testing experiences, which means they can definitely be trained to do other things, which I cannot wait to find <laughs> out what researchers have decided they need to train crabs to do in the name of science. I am so excited. <laughs> <laughs> no, now you're just going to start training crabs. I can see you with a top hat mm -hmm. and a <laughs> little little training crab hat. circus. <laughs> I crab already circus. have a top hat. I know. <laughs> I know about it. <laughs> Welcome to Blair's uh, Crab Circus. My well, you know what else would be in my crab <laughs> circus? <laughs> the world's yeah. fastest ant. Oh, yeah. Yes. What's up with that? Yes. So this is from the University of Ulm, Germany. They wanted to look at Saharan silver ants. That ca That's Cataglyphus bombicina. bombicina. Um, and they live in the Sahara, which they sometimes venture out of their nest to look for, uh, they, they're scavengers, so they, they are often grabbing the deceased remains of other animals that have perished out on the savanna, and they'll do that in the heat of the day, sometimes 60 degrees Celsius, the sand, which um, is it's hot. It's fair. It's it's about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. It's hot. So it's hot. That does really give your tootsies a blister. Uh, but so the, the these Saharan silver ants will go out onto the sand at that temperature. And in studying these ants and just kind of their general behavior, researchers noticed that they were really fast. Um, how fast? Well, um, they... After watching them, just going, gosh, those ants were really fast, you guys. They returned in 2015 to film them. And then they spent the past uh, however many years, four years, I guess, looking at the film to kind of discern what's going on with them. They can go almost one meter a second, which wow. is so fast. That is very so quick. fast for an ant. It's actually 0.855 meters a second, pretty close to a meter. Um, and they, that's the equivalent of about 108 body lengths per second, which if you're doing some really rough math, that's like two football fields for us. Can you imagine running across two football fields in one second? In a second. Sign no, that ant up to my favorite sports <laughs> yeah. ball team immediately. That is very fast. And what? how do they do that? Well, their film found that they were swinging their legs at speeds of up to 1,300 millimeters per second. It's pretty fast. Just kind of whipping their legs back and forth. Um, and so they did this out in the wild. When they brought these ants into the lab, however... At only about 10 degrees Celsius, they were traveling way slower, about 0 0.05 meters per second. Because it wasn't so hot and they didn't need yeah. to run. They were going, their feet, ach, 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 ach. their feet weren't getting as heated up. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the fastest ant before this was at 0 0.62 meters per second, which is still pretty fast. Uh, but they're bigger, so that was only about 50 body lengths. So this is, by body lengths, this is almost twice as fast as that. More than twice as fast. So this makes them solidly, as far as we know, the world's fastest ant. Um, so uh, some other record-breaking 
animals for speed. The Australian tiger beetles go 171 body lengths per second. California coastal mites go 377 body lengths per second. But these guys are definitely the fastest ants found to date. What makes it also very interesting is that they found in these high-speed videos that their limbs are almost 20% shorter than some of their cousins. So they have shorter legs. You would think longer legs would make you faster. That does not appear to be the case. Um, so it all has to do with their gait. It, they're actually galloping. They have all six feet off the ground simultaneously as they run. Um, so they, what? yeah. So it's like wow. a gallop. Yeah. They it's might like a be whole so new level fast. of uh, Mulbridge experiment. Yeah. So they might be so fast because of the sand dune habitat, because it's so hot or even more likely because if they went slower, they might sink into the soft sand. So the next step here is to see more about how they can actually physically move so fast because the lead researcher suspects that their muscle contraction speeds might be close to physiological limits due to their size. So pretty fast. Mm -hmm. But when we find all of that out, we that can actually help us too. That can help us with uh, robotics or other things where we're trying to figure out how to move appendages on, on tech. So this is something that we could uh, kind of extrapolate to other uses, but for the most part, it's just really cool, really phenomenal. Yeah, I guess this is a thing with uh, fast, uh, being fast with legs at any scale then, because uh, horses will get all of their feet up off of the ground at some point mm -hmm. during, their, during their gallop. Uh, it looks like it, it works all the way down to ants. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the same principles. Yeah. I am skeptical about the sinking into the soft sand, just given the size of the sand and the size of the ants and the surface area and the weight and all. I'm just imagining they just ants just kind of float along the top of stuff like that. And yeah, that's I fair. Find they that can one, like, yeah, I find that one hard to hard to buy. But I, the yeah. temperature is a something point. more. I, I wonder. I. Yeah, you can make a so raft of ants. Ants make their own rafts of each other. <laughs> They're so buoyant. They don't <laughs> do. sink. So you're right. If they don't break surface tension on water, are they really going to sink in the sand? I, I don't know. I don't think so. Maybe it's like cartoon quicksand. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> That's right. Who knows, who's to say? Quicksand for ants. I need to tell you about elbows. That's what oh. I need to do. Yeah, I, I got two you. of them. Do you have two elbows? I have two elbows also. Um, and so if you had a skeleton and you needed to figure out what sex that skeleton is, what would you look at first? Elbows. The pelvis. <laughs> <I know. laughs> <laughs> just a guess, <laughs> just a guess based on the lead into the story. Right, right, right. But not typically, uh, what is the, uh, pelvis, the pelvis, right? Yeah, because pelvis, especially then... if it, if they had had a baby, the pelvis shifts, right? So that would be a very, that would be a dead giveaway for a female skeleton because they'd have the shifted pelvis. Right, so the pelvis and uh, usually leg bones, uh, the length of leg bones are sexually dimorphic, which means that there are different forms, different sizes for the male and females. And so forensic anthropologists can use very often the pelvis to determine, or sometimes the skull to determine. Ribs if you got them. Right. To, but it's sometimes if you're looking at anthropo anthropological, archaeological sites, you don't always have all the bones. No. And so if you have a couple of factors that you can look at to figure things out, uh, it makes it better. But the pelvis, the skull, long bone measurements, these are all things that have been used historically by these anthropologists. Looking at these things who are typically from oh, Western countries and all of the measurements that we've ever done have been based on North American bones and skeletons and research researchers just did an analysis and they determined that these North American bones do not accurately determine sex 
for Asian populations. And You're so, saying North American, but are we talking European or is that... Uh... It's mostly North American. So really? a lot of the, the these parameters that have been determined have come from measurements of North American skeletons. And that's how we've determined, hey, here in North America, there are, you know, differences in pelvis and skull and long bones that allow us to determine the sex. And based on the fact that many individuals from came from Asia across the Bering Strait, they just kind of said, hey, we can apply it to everything. No, no, they can't. They can't. And now researchers looked at 600 skeletons th from uh, Thailand and determined that one new measurement they can make a sexual dimorphism is in the elbows. <sighs> there are aspects of the the end of the humerus bone, your funny bone, right? When you hit your funny bone, the end of the humerus where it uh, where the elbows, where the bones knock together, um, lock together, then that that area has aspects to the shape, the size, the the orientation of notches in the bones mm -hmm. that are sexually dimorphic. And they were able to create accurate biological profiles that can be used moving forward in Asia that are accurate. And it's great in an area of the world where there are tsunamis and uh, earthquakes and all the weather aspect weather conditions that lead to a lot of people potentially being buried or um, having been lost or maybe there are anthropological sites that have come to come come into our attention that need to be uh, unearthed I mean, populations that we need to discover more about and now we can actually tell what those populations were made up of more accurately Hmm. Who knew hmm. all the measurements from North American skeletons weren't applicable to the rest of the world? Who knew? Now we know. Elbows! If you have an elbow bone, you can sex a skeleton in Thailand. Hmm. Ah. Who else has another story? Hey, Blair, you want to tell me a story? Yeah! Um, sharks! They they love each other. Um, not really though. <laughs> this is this is a study from Australia looking at white sharks. We call them great white sharks here in California and Oregon and Washington, um, on the west coast of the United States. But they are assumed to be solitary predators, but they will gather in large groups when there are feeding opportunities, when there is a group of baby seals or something like that, that, that will kind of call to the great white sharks and they'll congregate. And um, we have found in the past that certain great whites will go to a lot of the same places kind of habitually throughout their life. But it was assumed previously that the groupings of these sharks were essentially random. The individuals just turned up in the same area because they were attracted by abundant food. But looking at photo identification and network analysis, they found out that the groups they hang out in will persist for years. They looked at four and a half years of photographs of almost 300 sharks, and they found that sharks formed four distinct communities, which showed that some sharks are more likely to use the site simultaneously than expected by chance. So even amongst the fact that we knew that there were sharks that always went to the Farallons, for example, just because right. that's my personal example out here, um, the time that certain individuals were near one another was more than chance. They were like, oh, hey, Dave, how are the seals today? <laughs> <laughs> so they definitely, they have preferences for who they're hanging out with. So they're actually more, I mean, I, I don't know if gregarious, that's probably going too far. We don't know if they enjoy being near each other, but they definitely have preferences for who they share their space with, which is pretty cool. That's, in, yeah, it's very cool. I, you would often think of them, like you said, as just being these solitary individuals who congregate because that's where the food is it's kind of coming to the watering hole the feeding the feeding hole um but i honestly as i mentioned at the beginning of the show had I've, i have never thought of great white sharks as having a social structure of any yeah. kind. so this is this is a bit mind-blowing to me 
Yeah. So, I mean, sharks were under underestimated once again. <laughs> and so this is just a reminder that shark research is this huge area that needs help. A lot of people don't study sharks because they have this kind of huge PR problem. But there's mm -hmm. so much still that we need to know about these animals that actually need our help. Shark sharks are disappearing mainly because people don't like them because they think they're solitary, scary killing machines. So the more we can know about them, hopefully the less scary they will be and uh, the better they can do. We want to keep our sharks for sure. For sure. We love sharks. And Justin, what story do you have? Uh, last thing I got for today is plants. They're uh, for over a billion years. Uh, they have uh, been just about everywhere on the planet. They come in very amazing shapes and forms and are as an exotic thing on the planet as can be found. Mm -hmm. uh, and a project known as the 1000 Plant Transcriptomics Initiative, 1KP, has uh, put the task to 200 plant biologists to sequence genes for more than 1,000 or 1,100 plant species spanning the entire green tree of life. And uh, they're announcing some results now. They've uh, just published in Nature. So what they've, what they've done is, uh, you know, one of those things that you might assume is already being done now that we have this fantastic technology of sequencing genomes. Of course, we've found uh, the genomes for all these different vari uh, various plants. But however, the majority of the sequencing that's been done on plants has been done on pretty specific crop species uh, and tends to get better harvest right. or better, uh, better versions of a crop that is resistant to uh, a blight or a pest of some sort. So this is the first time they just have apparently gotten the, the biggest data set of genomes from plants just to look at plant evolution and fit plants into their their family tree to see sort of what shows up where. Uh, and they did find some sort of interesting things. One of the things uh, is that one of the strategies they found, uh, plant genomes, is a lot of plants will just duplicate a gene. Where they had one gene that does something, they now have in the future generations two, and then maybe four sets of the same genes, uh, which seems a little uneconomical, except then over time, some of those additional sets can begin to mutate freely and take on new aspects. Other plant lines they found would work on uh, mutations and modifications to a very set uh, subset of, of genes without doing the whole duplication and adding uh, the entire genome to itself over and over again. So they found different strategies throughout different plant families, which also then starts to allow them to group uh, families. One of the surprising findings was that mosses, liverworts, and hornworts uh, form a single related group, which is actually what was a centuries old hypothesis that had only been reversed in recent decades. So uh, that, that whole thing that we do where we, uh, we start labeling things and start putting them into groups so that we can better understand how they're related and how evolution take, took place is, is is now possible through this this project. They now have a fantastic set of data. So if you're a plant biologist, hopefully you'll have an opportunity to tap into this and compare the plants you have of interest to what they have laid out for for you here. Yeah, I love I I love it when you when scientists go from just the morphological description to be able to take for categorizing and then take the genetic information into account and it it shifts our understanding so like in the bird world we've seen all sorts of categorizations shift where species have gone from you know from one family to another or you know become their own uh, genus and species and it, there's all sorts of interesting aspects. So it's neat. The moss, the moss getting their own little category separate mm -hmm. from the liverworts. Mosses ain't just liverworts anymore. They're not the same. No, that's cool. The diversity of life. And 
it's neat that there there's this project is just going and going and going. I was clicking through links on this story and they're going for 10,000 genomes next. And mm-hmm. that's all part of the massive uh, attempt to sequence all life on the planet. And so eventually, eventually. I, and this, uh, to, to, to just a slight correction, the, it did put the mosses in with the liverworts. It did make them. Uh, oh, I thought uh, it separated them. No, no, no. It, so they, oh, the other way. They, they got separated over recent decades, but uh, for like hundreds of years before, somehow they had been already related. So. Got it. Uh, fine tuning and understanding of fine uh, tuning. plant relationship. Yes. Fine tuning all the things. <gasps> we love fine tuning. That's what science is about. Big questions going down to fine tunings. And all about who we are, where we are in this world. Have we done it? We did it. Did we make it to the end? We made it to the end of another show. Thank you for being Mm. with us the whole time. Thank you, everyone. Big thanks to Melanie Mitchell for joining us for the interview tonight. Thank you to Gord McLeod for helping in the chat room. Thank you to Fada for helping out with social media and our show notes. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And I would love to say thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Paul Disney, Ed Dyer, Andrew Swanson, Craig Landon, Andy Groh, Ed Stupolik, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Richard Porter, Mark Mazaros, Jack, Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K, Bob Calder, Eric Knapp, Richard, Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Howard Tan, Goma K, Donald Mundus, Sarah Forfar, Dan K, Matt Bay, Starwin Hannon, Patrick Pecoraro, Ben Bignell, Gene Tellier, John Gridley, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavis, Rodney Lewis, Tiffany Boyd, John Bertram, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stephen Albaran, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zugnurek, Ashish Panch, Ulysses Adkins, Artie Omrick, Ramus Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Suzuki, Jim Trapo, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Steve Leesman, Kurt Mark Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie, Gary S., Robert, Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthan, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessenflo, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and EO. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. If you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience or click the Patreon link at twist.org. On next week's show, we are going to be discussing microbiomes or the lack thereof. Mm-hmm. With Tobin Hammer. And once again, I love this guy's name, Tobin Hammer. It's a fantastic name. Once again, we will be broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time, twist.org slash live. You can watch and join the chat room, join the conversation. But if you can't make it, don't worry because everything's archived. You can find past episodes at our YouTube channel or twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. And remember, tell your friends about Twist. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. Again, that's www.twist.org. While you're there, you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Oh, and also while you're there, you better pre-order that 2020 Twist Blair's Animal Corner calendar. While supplies last. Yes, or you can contact contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line. Otherwise, what will happen to your email? Spam filtered into oblivion. Spam filtered into oblivion, if you don't put that in the subject line. You can also hit us up on the uh, Twitter where we are, at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, Please let us know. I thought you were starting a wrap there. Um, We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. (laughs) This week in science.
This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Cause this week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just yet understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. Jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of toxoplasma Gandhi, I, 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 I. Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 this week in 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 science. And that's all she wrote, folks. It's the after show. We've made it to the after show. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching. Hope you like a lot of the science. And it's oh, so much twists every Wednesday. Don't you like to join us today? Come watch science. Come watch science. Everybody likes to science with us today. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> My improv. My musical improv. improv is even harder than normal improv. My musical improv is on point. No. <laughs> That's right. New theme song, Hot Rod. That's it. New theme song. <laughs> People in the chat room are talking about how the song at the end needs updating. <laughs> Thunder Beaver. It needs updating to protecting us from the Environmental Destruction Agency and Anti-Science Administration. Yes. So, yeah, Insane Clown Posse, I guess. But that's like circus music. I'll put Justin back in the stream again. You're back. There we go. Everybody twist and shouty. Yes, Daniel uh, Yount. 
So just realized there's a hundred uh, percent chance. I think that I will be missing next week's show. Oh no! I was thinking you would love next week's interview. Yeah. 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 I would. Uh, yeah. But I will be. I think I'll be on an airplane. That will make it very difficult. Yes. 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 Very difficult. You could oh, pay no, for Wi Fi and at least just watch and be in the chat room. You'd be in the chat room, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I can even get the. Well, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I gotta. I gotta check it. I'm still confused on how time works, works while traveling. <laughs> it changes. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's a possibility I might be in an airport, uh, land in an airport. Oh, which means I'd be in, uh, I might be in Blair's neighborhood. Hmm. Okay, we'll have to, I'll have to look at the itinerary thingy. Uh, yeah, you're over. welcome to stop by for the broadcast. <laughs> How long yeah. is your layover? Depending. Yeah. Depending. I mean, on are you on wait? Are you is. flying into SFO or are you? Are you have a layover? Huh? No, no, no. I would be uh, at some point. I believe I would be landing in Oakland. Oh, oh well, that's not my neighborhood. It's the oh, Bay God. Area. It's in the area. It's the Bay Area. It's not Oakland far. isn't as close to you as it is to me. No, 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 no. You're very good. <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying miles. I'm saying drive time. Oh, well, that, you're talking about traffic or something. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what I'm telling you. Yeah. It's, it's about the same. It's close. It's right around the corner. <laughs> it's not. Same thing. It's fun. Uh, you remember when we took BART from San Francisco to Oakland Airport? It took yeah, like it an hour terrifying. and a half. Hmm? It took like an hour and a half. Did it really? Yeah. That makes no sense. Because the actual BART ride only took like 45 minutes, but we had to take Muni to BART, and then we took BART to a, a separate light rail system that took us from BART to the airport. We took three different kinds of public transit that day. That's insane. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a lot sense. of transit. Yep. That's Ooh, the mass transit, transit. Uh, here is pretty cool. Nice. Uh, yeah. It's everywhere. It's almost, there's almost too much. <laughs> it's almost too much. There's no, there's no parking if you did get a car. It's like <laughs> right. you there's no parking because, to put it. yeah, there's, everybody's on it. But uh, it's just a simple card that you beep in when you start and beep out when you leave someplace. So it's like, oh, you're keeping track of travel minutes, less so than it matters where you're going or whatever. It's just by time. How, how much time are you spending on mass transit? You sort of beep in when you start a trip and beep out uh, at the end. Pretty clever. Beep. Don't see people fussing with uh, tickets and putting things in machines. It's just mm -hmm. this, yeah, very simple. Boop, beep. You could, um, just you could just implant an RFID chip in your arm and then it'd be, you'd just have your tag with you all the time yeah which if you did 10 years ago it wouldn't work anymore because they've changed yeah. the system so it's it's also that's the kind of nice thing about keeping it external is that when the update comes you don't have to go right. in for surgery you don't have another one yeah. yeah okay so no justin next week probably possibly yeah no, it, sounds, it seems very in transit likely. okay um, I need some information to you finish need the information. calendar. Yeah, so so I um, currently do not have a show on January first. Yes, which is yeah, New Year's Day, Blair. Yeah, just, that's. <laughs> I know. I'm just. Day. I'm just checking. I'm just checking. That's all. I just want to make sure I'm doing what you want. It's really it's so I, I I'm going to tell you I um I went I went to all my friends and I said, do we have plans for New Year's? What's happening New Year's? Should I schedule a show? And they told me to tell you no. Heather and okay. Jojo said no. 
<laughs> for but for New Year's Day, were you being clear? We're not that like this isn't the thirty first. This is yeah. the day after New Year's, yeah. really. Yeah. 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 A day fine. that's still a holiday. It's a holiday. It's a holiday. Um my and, other know, we do we do I'm good I'm just gonna say we didn't take any like we take like two shows off a year yeah. which i think is way like, less than the average <laughs> way less than the average and you know if we want to we can schedule it for a, another day do it you know on a we can do um but i think if we're going to say our prediction show and have it on the calendar Mm -hmm. I think we put that on the 8th. And if we decide to do a show in between mm -hmm. and, you know, get one in there like on the 3rd or the 4th or something just so that we do another one, we can do that. But otherwise, I think it could be very nice to have some time off. I'm with it. I'm all about it. I mean, I know everybody loves the twists being all the time and all the weeks, but I think having, I, I think for, yeah, for my sanity of the editing and the doing, I mean, you guys do mm. the show and then you're done. And yeah, I still, true. I still have like another day or two of work. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not, for me, yeah. it's not, it's not just come in and do the show and be done and as much fun as it would be then it's like yeah. oh and now i have to now i have to do that and i have to publish it and i have to put it up and i have to do this and yeah okay there's more considerations so i for my mental sanity yes i'm going to take mm -hmm. that day off so Good. let's make the eighth the prediction show you got it next yes <laughs> um next. do we Boundaries. have do we have information about Sketchfest. No, I haven't heard from anybody about Oof. Sketchfest. Okay, curious. All right, I will hold on. I mm -hmm. mean, I feel like we've put it on the calendar pretty much every year we've done it, so I feel like we've had information by around now. I know they said they send out information by early November at the latest, so I feel mm -hmm. like we should be getting it soon. Let's see. It's a yeah. That's like a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm The other thing is if we have information on when we're at AAAS and if I want to put that on the calendar. Hmm. I wouldn't put that on the calendar because that would, might not even be life. We, we have a lot of unknowns there. It might we do be have unknowns a lot of unknowns until we get there. <laughs> I mean, we're okay. going to be there, but uh, yeah. we can put okay. twists. We can, we're going to be in Seattle. We can just put the there. festival there. The triple A S, yeah. Okay. Those those but days are pretty uh they have other things on them stuff. already, but that's okay. Um people in the chat room, would you like us to put how would you like us to note the triple A S conference that is not the Saturday is a public day that people can come to. It's like a family days. Science so if that people could come see the podcast on Saturday, but um, Friday, I don't know that the family days are open and it's, I think the podcast would be only for people at the conference on the Friday. If I put it on the 15th, I have to delete either Galileo Galilei's birthday. No. Or National Hippo Day. Yeah, that, oh. one, that one can go. Let's, uh, Those are the, the, it's did full. you just see Blair's face? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the 15th is full. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's leave it off. That's yeah, fine. okay. We don't know for sure all the details. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Identity 4. Yes, you can visit the AAAS thingy over the weekend. Saturday and Sunday they do an open... Um, they have an open family days thing so that uh, the public can come and interact and they have booths and things that are specifically for the public. So yes, you can come to the AAAS thingy for a um, day. And on Saturday the 15th, we will be doing a half an hour twist broadcast at... Uh, 
when did I get that last year? So I'm just Saturday. Keeping... Mm-hmm. What? Mm. Um, yeah, Ooh. Saturday. Well, we're doing Friday and Saturday, but Saturday the fifteenth is the one that I think will be the public can come to. Oh. We're going to be doing a secret non-public uh, thing. So Blair, I think my the last oh, time okay. that they reached out was the very beginning of November for Sketchfest. Okay. So the yeah, okay. in 2017, I got an email on November 3rd. Okay, so I guess it's a question oh. of whether we want to wait to order to find out about that or not. But we can cross that bridge when we come to it. We can. We might be able to wait to order that long, but you can tentatively put it in because it will be the third. It will be the Thursday night Cal Academy thing. Right, but I don't so. know which Thursday. Well, does it? Do you know when Sketchfest is? Are there it's, two Thursdays? Yeah, it's usually two to three weeks of January. Oh, jeez. I know. <laughs> I know I'm frustrated because I'm also trying to, like, plan my personal life around that. And <laughs> I'm not sure what it's going to be. <laughs> it's, I mean, last year it was the Thursday before Martin Luther King Day, but mm -hmm. it's not always. Okay, January 9th to 26th. Yeah, that's a broad little bit. So the 9th. Mm -hmm. To the 20s, yeah. So uh, it's either, it could be the 9th, 16th, or 23rd. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> How right. grand. How grand. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. We, we can, we might wait on that one. Um, okay. I'm just looking at other, so Twist is on April Fool's Day. That'll be fun. Yay. Um, oh, my God. We could do a fake science show. Oh, my God. That'd be so fun. It would be super fun. And then we could have we could have people vote on what they think is the real story. Oh, what's that's the, what's very the fake fun. story. We could do one of yes. those kinds of things. I love that. No, oh, I did it before. It says, I hope the AAAS thingy will be in the calendar. I went to go write it down in the calendar, but I don't have it yet. <laughs> Good. <laughs> You'll have to Thank wait, you. my dude. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, okay, I'm just looking for other potential conflicts here I had questions about. Um, and then I have to do all of the research on all the dates. It's like the least favorite part. My least favorite part of making the calendar. It's so frustrating. Oh, oh, I uh, I have a good tip for you. Yeah. Uh, you could look at last year's calendar. That's what she does. But oh. some of the dates change. Yeah, they change. So some uh, some dates are like November this, this 1st number. every year. Yes. And some are the third Thursday. Oh, that's in annoying. In November. That's yeah. really annoying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's very frustrating. Um, so as we did this year, I did not put an episode of Twist the night before Thanksgiving. Speaking of one of the two episodes we normally take off. Oh. I think it's, I want to say it's not on our calendar this year. Like we decided to give ourselves the day before Thanksgiving off. Oh, well, I could do it this year probably. Here, let me, let me double check. <laughs> Hold on one second. I don't know when this uh, day is, when this takes place. Uh, it's a Wednesday. It's a Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> the 27th oh Wednesday. so it's uh, Wednesday day, right, right the, near uh, Indigenous Peoples Day the Is night the before Indigenous I'm Peoples totally Day wrong. Yeah. I'm totally wrong it says twist giving on the calendar that's why it wasn't on there is because it said twist giving oh, so like I missed it when I was yeah when I was messing with stuff um, let's see where are you yeah, because usually the night before is totally fine. It's just the day, like Thursdays. Um, day. And thank goodness Halloween is on a Thursday, really, this year. Yeah. Last year we took the Halloween off because trick-or-treating with kids. Come on. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Come on. Come on. I mean, yeah, of course. Of course. Um, oh, I have a question for you. Um, just, I'd like advice. I would like advice okay. from people. Uh, I have the potential to uh, start doing kind of like a, a science in the pub kind of night at uh, the Hawthorne Hop House here in town. Oh, that's fun. Which is fun. And uh, I'm all of a sudden like, yeah, I can organize this stuff and do this. And then I'm like, huh. So should I ask for some kind of percent of the bar or mm. should, or do I just do it and then pass a tip bowl around? Like, <laughs> Oh God. <laughs> like um, for the, you know, I mean, it's like part of it is like, Hey, I'll be like, you know, produced by this week in science or, you know, whatever. Um, I can but, tell you um, what I did when I, I did pub quizzes or should I just do it and then see how, just see how it goes. Yeah. yeah. What's the pub quiz? So uh, pub yeah. quizzes usually are given a flat rate by the place. Mm-hmm. So the idea is the better job that you do, the more people you bring into the bar for them. Yeah. But then the idea is you would do one or two probably for free. It's like mm-hmm. proof of concept and hype it up. So that they don't lose money. But then after that, you're like, okay, give me $300 every time I do this. Right. And then everything else that they do is on them. Mm-hmm. So that's, I mean, that's roughly adjusted for inflation now. <laughs> what the cost would be compared to what I was charging. In San Francisco. At the time. Um, no, I bet it would be more now. Because I was getting 200 or 250 depending on the bar. That's, and that was that's a pretty good night. Yeah, stage. and Davis, it wow. was well, I didn't make that, yeah. though. That oh. went to the company. Oh, <laughs> that went okay. to the pub quiz company. I made some of that. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, I love... <laughs> You're refusing to tell us how much you made. No, I actually don't pub- remember. I oh, just remember okay. I got some of it. <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what I would probably go for a flat rate. Cause then if, if the, if it rains, which it does in Portland and, uh, and some people don't come out on a night, then you're, you're putting the same effort in. Right. So I think that's part of why we did the flat rate for the pub quizzes too, is like, if you have a bad night, I have to do the exact same amount of work. Yeah. And you might not be yeah. bringing in people who wouldn't already be there. You might just be uh, that night's entertainment for the local crowd, anyhow. Yeah, I'm like, I'm of this like, I'm part of me is like, oh yeah, that'd be awesome. But then I'm like, oh, if I'm doing that, and then, you know, should I try and get some money so that I can pay the uh, the speakers? You know, like if I'm getting scientists to come in and present. Are they going to be happy just being paid in beer? Mm. Um, or should, do am I should I make sure I have money to pay them? Um, and should I, if I'm paying them, should I get money for organizing? And then also, you know, maybe I don't want to do any of that, but take the money and put it towards science talk, or take the money and put it toward mm. this week in science, or you know, like there are like maybe I can, I'm like okay. How how should is it, what should I do? What should I do? Find, yeah, if I'd find out how much a band gets to play yeah. at a place and like go for something like that. It's a night's yeah. entertainment. That's what it would be for the pub. Well, yeah, and I, exactly. I feel like yeah. a lot of your guest speakers probably have books or something like that that they can sell at the event, mm-hmm. which I feel like is their added value or at least something right. that they can promote. So if they mm-hmm. have something to promote, that's that's kind of what you're paying them in is exposure. Yeah. Exposure kills people. True. But it also can <laughs> make a career. It can make a career. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Last Let's scheduling questions for Good. 2020. 50 to 100 bucks, says Thunder Beaver. Mm. Um. Twists in December does not fall on anything. It falls on the 23rd and the 30th. So we're good with shows, right? Or do we want to 
take Wait. one off. Wait, what? In Next December year. 2020. Oh, we're stop. Talking, we're talking <sighs> calendar. I'm just asking. I'm just just asking. put them on. Put them on. We'll we'll probably do them. One or I mean my, two or all of us. We'll my my point is if we make the decision to not, then we won't. And we're yeah. going to like this this is why I'm asking and I want to be deliberate. Because right now mm -hmm. we're saying, what did we do on this calendar? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or did we say we were gonna do a show? So like I'm just trying to be deliberate so we can plan for the year. So if this is the plan is to do the shows, that's great. If we want to consider taking a day off in December, that's also great. I'm just, I'm floating it out there. I want to see how everyone's feeling. And I would like to set an intention, even if it changes later. I like, I like intentions. Yeah. Yes. I um, would put it for every Wednesday. Uh, and then uh, we can inform listeners uh, a week ahead, if or two weeks ahead, if we know that we're not going to be able to make one in the in that year. But I would I would set it there, even uh, I, because it's twist night. Even if it's yeah. uh, hey, even if it's not a new live show, it's still twist night. Yeah, it is still twist night. But I'm just trying to think of um, kids schedules. I'm imagining that next year they will ha have their holiday from the 21st mm -hmm. through the 1st. Mm -hmm. um, and if I if I do travel at all, it'll be during that time period. But still, if I have internet, if I'm traveling, I would be able to do... Um, unless I'm somewhere like New Zealand. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would be able to do um, I would be able to do the shows and we can cancel them but we could also if we want to put down specifically the year in review show we oh, can yes. schedule that one for the 16th okay and then do the prediction show on the first Wednesday of January okay and so then that leaves the 23rd and the 30th as regular shows Right. That we could do or cancel, depending. Do you like that, Justin? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Or would you rather we could do the prediction show on the 23rd? I just, yeah, it's just hard to say because those are going to be like the holiday vacation yeah. time that people with jobs and the kids from school and all that kind of stuff have. Um, and so, yeah, I think we should, I, I want to be. What? what are you saying? No, I think what? I think Kiki's just making a, a, a valid point, which is um, part of being our best selves is taking care of ourselves. And there is a potential that it, it might actually be really good for one or multiple members of us to take a week off during a time when everyone's off of work and lots of stuff is going on. Yeah. Okay, sure. So I, we and don't have you, to decide this right this second. No, but so we'll but put we it can, on there. But we we're ruminate. talking about a, a year from now. Yes, yes we are. We are. But okay. we're also taking two weeks yeah. off this year. So there's taking two weeks off this year and then zero weeks off next year are very different strategies. So that's why I'm just wondering. Yeah. Voting it out there. Both yeah, you're talking to somebody who has a, a planning brain that goes out about a month. Yeah, I know. About no, I get a month. That. I get that. Us, which is us why talking about AAA. And you're talking AAA. about a year. Mm -hmm. You're talking about, you could be saying 10 years from now, it's as relevant to my brain as a year from now. Okay. 20 well, years from now, Justin, on the, on the, in the middle of December. Well, I'm the person that. At 10 o'clock in the morning. Calendar no, I hear you. I hear you. And I have stuff going on I, every night of I'm the week. I'm just saying, you need to not consult me. You need to not consult me. want to explode. You need to not consult me, but just tell me what's happening a year from now. And that will work. <laughs> I need not. I have no capacity to okay. plan a year in advance thing. It's so Justin is vehemently anti canceling shows, but also. Anti planning responsibility so, for thinking about it. Yeah. So yeah. that being said, perhaps that vote is weighted slightly less. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So really, what I'm trying to say is, Kiki, reflect. <laughs> oh, 
Mm -hmm. she left. Okay. She left. So I guess my vote now counts oh, plenty right. because it's it's one that's left here. Um, yeah. So yes, Kiki, reflect. Let me know what you think. Um, I think that planning to take even just the 30th off next year is not a bad idea just to have a planned break. Mm -mm. So think about it. We don't have to decide right this second. But if we plan ahead and we decide yeah. to take it off of the calendar, then people are not expecting us. And I also think that's nice. So, yeah. Uh, Identity Four says just put a disclaimer on the calendar. <laughs> Twist broadcast subject to change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Which is always true. And then Hot Rod says, we come first, family comes second. Exactly. Oh that's <laughs> it's what not even saying. family. It's my this brain. Is family. So, um, I, you know, if I don't plan to take time off, I don't take time off, which is part of this is me recognizing that in my professional and personal life, in my day job, I have to very deliberately plan days off or I never take days off and then I want to go insane. So, yeah. So, uh, and also if, uh, if, uh, if we are going to take to a day off anywhere in the schedule, um, that very late December, early January is the right time. Because also publications have slowed, which is also yeah. part of why we have the prediction show and the year in review show also because, you know, at some point looking at the new stories that were out that week, uh, wow, there really weren't many because everybody is uh, on vacation. Yeah, yeah. well, and uh, I know for me personally, my podcast queue of things that I listen to builds up during those two weeks because I'm doing so much stuff with other people. Mm -hmm. So people and I might not have as much listening hours around that time anyway. Unless they're traveling long distances mm -hmm. to visit family. Mm -hmm. We're mm -hmm. good for that. Mm -hmm. We're good for that. Um, yeah, that'll be awesome. I don't okay. know. There's going to be... Oh, okay. And she's gone. And she's gone. There is going to be two weeks... Ah. I don't know if it's going to be the first two weeks of July or the last week of June and the first week of July. But I'm going to France. Oh. I'm going to go to Europe and go to France uh -huh. in 2020, and I'm very excited. Oh, sun's coming up. Mm -hmm. It's starting to get brighter. I'm so sorry. It's okay. Oh, is that your easel? That's uh, an easel. Ooh, look at the sun coming up. Ooh. That's as bright as it gets all day long. No. That's it. This is, yeah, this is midday in Denmark. Mm -hmm. You can see it's got the uh, clear gray sky. Mm -hmm. Some nice light coming in. Good windows. Yeah. Amazing windows. Yeah. Yep. But I am excited. Thunder Beaver, you're part French Canadian. That's funny. Yeah, I am excited. So June, July, end of end of. June, beginning of July, I'm going to be gone for a couple of weeks, but that doesn't mean that the show cannot go on. Okay. The show will continue. I just have to learn how to use StreamYard by then. Yeah. It's easy. Great. Can't you wait. Can totally. You can totally do it. I was pretty amazed. I'm like, this is really easy. I like it. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is great. Um, Doop, doop, doo, 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 doo. Have you either of you seen Unnatural Selection on Netflix mm -mm. yet? I heard about it, but I have highly, not seen it yet. Highly recommend it. I think it was really good. There's a lot of debate. Um, I was on Twitter talking to people about it all weekend long. I think it was really good. Mm. I think it covers stuff. And there's some other, I guess there are some other documentaries that are coming out about... Um, gene editing and biohacking and all sorts of stuff. It's a big topic right now. It's awesome. The world is changing. 
What does it mean to be human? <laughs> that should be a narrator, right? <laughs> that would be fantastic. <laughs> It's my anti Attenborough. <laughs> what does it mean to be human? One of my many voices. Okay, what's going on next week? Halloween. Are we wearing costumes for Twistaween? Ed asked earlier. Oh, it's on if actual there... Halloween? No, no, it's the night before. It's the night before. Okay. It's the night before. We don't need costume costumes. Yeah, can... I'll do a little something something. Do a little something, something if you feel like it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, Ed was asking what whether there's a family costume in the works. At this point in time, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. Um, I have to figure something out. Um, Kai wants to be a Dementor. Oh, my God. <laughs> what is a Dementor? I don't even know what that is. It's from Harry Potter. They suck it, souls out things? of people. It's yeah. A, yeah, it's a soul sucker. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Those are yeah. scary. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's Halloween's good. for scaries. He wants to be a Dementor. So I don't know. Maybe I'll be like, I could probably dress myself up like, um, what was the name of the, uh, the, was it Divination? Yes, Mrs. Trelawney. Mrs. Trelawney. Professor Trelawney. I bet I could do that up pretty nicely. Get myself a little crystal ball. Yes, that would be fun. Ooh, it, it just takes lots of scarves and... Mm -hmm. Big layers. glasses. Big glasses. Yeah. Yeah, I could do that. It could be Trelawney. That's something yeah. I could put together pretty easily. I don't know. I might need to get a wand. Yeah. You'll be mm. able to find one of those pretty easily. Or you could just go find a nice stick. I know, just go, I'll just go find a stick. I'll go for a walk. Yeah. I'll get a stick. Yes, PDX is an easy place to get witchy. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wait, what? Hot Rod's going to be a streaker? <laughs> The costume is cheap, but That's the jail time costume. is expensive. <laughs> Good one. That's, well, that's guess what? In San Francisco, no jail time for that. No, that's right. You can, you can, you can be naked. Ex public exposure what? is totally legal. What? Yeah. That's yeah. real. That's ridiculous. Yeah, it's real. You can. You have to. Be you have to carry a towel if you go into public places. You must sit on a towel. Mm -hmm. That is the only rule. Thank goodness it's cold there. Yeah. There I is. Remember there going are a few like... people that go urban hiking in the Castro in mm -hmm. nothing but hiking boots and some of those hiking like walking sticks. It's just the thing that they do. Yeah. I've gone to like so many of the, the street festivals in San Francisco and there are just there are a number of people who were just there yeah maybe wearing shoes and yeah. sunblock on their nose yeah and there's the <laughs> naked bike ride that's a thing it's, that's in which Portland. sounds so uncomfortable and it's here they too. stole they stole that from Portland well, I'm not surprised <laughs> but it always seems to catch me by surprise like I always like forget that mm -hmm. it's happening and then I'm like what a what a what a Oh, <laughs> there's so many. There's so many naked people on bicycles. Like, was that guy? Was she I just? That oh. just looks uncomfortable. Oh, it look, does look really uncomfortable. I can't imagine a bike seat no. without clothing. But no. Oh, Seattle says there's a naked bike ride. Uh, Identity says there's a naked bike ride in Seattle. Also, that's a lot of seriously. That's a lot of naked bike riding. Jeez. Oh my goodness. Justin, the audio was better today. I think next time. Um, I don't know. Was it I found Justin a little bit loud? Was he fine to you or was it loud when I was doing this? As opposed to talking like this? No, no I think you were of... farther away. You were just getting excited. It was really loud. <laughs> yeah, well that's just gonna happen. Well, it's just so that's not the mic's we, fault. 
Maybe last week you hadn't had enough coffee or something because there was I I had to cut out a bunch of stuff because you like mumbled off into nothingness. <laughs> <laughs> there were a bunch of you'd be like yeah. and and this and then and, him, and there was this I was like I'm editing it afterwards. I was like, what happened there? <laughs> I thought I could hear it when we it's were It's early. It's early in the morning that I'm getting up to do the show now. Very yeah. early. It's you're, not a comfortable place for for an entire No. It's, it's, yeah, that's it. That mumble. That mumble. There you go. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, okay, Franz de Waal, you saw him talk at the university last night or Yes. That's I've always wanted to see. I want I want to get him on the show. Oh yeah, he's, he's an uh, interesting guy. Interesting research, decades of research yeah. uh and Fun stories, good speaker, uh, yeah. fantastic. Uh, yeah, yeah, he's got some like his books are amazing, and he's just a he seems like just such an interesting. And he person. is currently promoting a book, uh, "Mama's Last Hug." Yes, mm. that's right. so that's the sort of thing that sometimes uh, motivates people to go on talk Podcast. shows, podcasts, that sort of yes. thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Does mm -hmm. we've got no uh, lack of microbiomes next week? We've got um, oh the bug chicks. The bug chicks are going to come talk to us on in the beginning of November. Bug mm -hmm. chicks. The bug chicks. Yeah, they do in bug bug education, and they're fun mm. and awesome. Cool. Um, That's so fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then who else is coming? And then after that, we're going to have astrophysicist Ethan Siegel on in the beginning of December. And he's going to talk with us about the Big Bang and kind of cool stuff that's happened during the year. He's also working on a book right now because he has his third book he's writing right now. And then I just spoke with a woman today. Her name's Virginia Butler. She's here at PSU and she does... Um, zooarchaeology or anthropology but she does she looks at like fish bones left over from human settlements and does a lot yeah. of uh really interesting anthropology archaeology work uh here in the pacific northwest with relation to native populations oh wow yeah that would yeah. be fun uh yeah and i talking with her today i was just like oh you're really awesome yeah she was great and so yeah, so we've got a few cool interviews lined up. So we're going to be... Oh, that's on your birthday, Justin. Yay! <laughs> we'll be talking... Happy with... birthday to me. Yeah, your birthday present is going to be an archaeology interview. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I thought it fit perfectly. It's like, oh, you want to do the 11th? Great, let's do that. Yeah, that'll be good. Um... Okay, so Justin's flying back this next week, and then you're going to be here for a couple weeks, and then you're going to be back to Denmark for a couple weeks. Uh, oh, boy. Uh, coffee. Yeah, it is. Um, going to be there for about a week. Yeah, hopefully I don't, I'm not going to uh, be flying for both shows. I'm going to have to build an itinerary <laughs> today and make sure I'm not missing two. Um, That's, this is the part of the planning that you don't normally yes. do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Uh, uh, but it is all direct flight. Um, That's awesome. So I will figure out uh, this, but uh, yeah, it's back for a short time. And then it'll be three weeks before I'm traveling again. Okay. And then more travels and more fun. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I need to get my passport updated. I want to mm -hmm. travel. I want to yes. go places. Yeah. 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 It, aren't there visa time limits is asking, is Hot Rod is asking. Ah, yeah. So time limit is 90 days. Mm. It's the maximum amount of time you can stay in one sitting 
Oh, but at any you could time, also just three months leave and come right back. I think, right? Yeah. But yeah, uh, I'll be back for a week, and then I will come back to Denmark for three weeks-ish, and then go back again, and then maybe come back to Denmark till Christmas. <laughs> we'll see. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Too. That's fun. Yay. Awesome. Okay. Um... Okay, we've got calendar. Blair, are you overloaded? Should we do a newsletter at some point? Ooh, we should, but we should do start one of those. Oh my god! Yeah, we should. But as soon uh, as I finish this, I have to yeah. finish the calendar first. That's going to take me a couple more hours at least to yeah, go through all of wanna... the events. Okay. Because I have to go literally one by one and Google it, and some of them they don't have the 2020 dates posted yet. So I have to go backwards in time and see if it's consistent yeah. for a few years. Most of them is a quick Google, but some of them take some, some detective them work. Take time. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So it's going to take me a little bit of time, but as soon as I'm done with that, I will send you the link so that you can order. And then we can start the conversation about the count, the, the newsletter. And I'll just, I'll write something about my trip to the yes. subarctic are you are you creating a protocol for future blair what do you mean uh like a list of the ones that are set dates a list of the ones that always follow a third thursday a list of the ones that always follow a first um just to make it I easier should. on yourself if you ever do this again yes no i absolutely should you're right i'll start a um we had um we had an excel sheet that we were working off of for a couple of years but it was not accurate Hmm. So I tossed it out last year, which okay. is why I'm starting from scratch again. But I will start an Excel sheet again. That is a good idea. Yeah. For somebody who doesn't plan mm -hmm. anything. It's no, no. It's, it. it is pretty a decent smart it. one. <laughs> Preventing myself from having to, to look into th the same thing over again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my, God. my child fell asleep. Now he's waking up again. Got to get him upstairs to bed. It's like he fell asleep and I'm like, I can be down here talking forever now. But I need to head to bed. I need to head to bed as well. I need to start yeah. my day. You need to start your day. We're on the opposite sides. And yeah, next week, twist a ween. Be fun. I'll be sorry to miss you, Justin, if you're on a plane. I, I'm, I'll try to make it. I don't know. I haven't. I don't have the, the itinerary set yet. So we'll you're just gonna out. like jump out of the plane with parachute. Be like, I gotta go to Twin. I gotta get closer to Wi-Fi. Need a hot spot. <laughs> There's Wi-Fi on planes. Yeah, but they charge God. for it. It's much cheaper to jump. Yeah, out. it's like twelve bucks. <laughs> It's not good enough Wi-Fi to stream. No, and but he could so. watch and be in the chat room. Or yeah, yeah. You I could, could do definitely that. I, do that. I could do that, maybe. But yeah, I wouldn't be... Uh, in the show. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't be able to... I'd be in a, I'll be in a sardine can. Mm -hmm. uh, packed in with funny. the other... I'm streaming. I bet there's rules. I bet you can't do that. No, I'm streaming it's just, live so it's just, from an airplane. It's just social rules. That's rude. No, I bet the, I, I have a feeling there's actual rules. That mm. seems like something you shouldn't, like, they would keep you from doing for some reason. Yeah, maybe. Mm. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. I, 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 honestly, I can't think of a whole lot of journalism I've seen live from an airplane. Yeah. Like, zero. Unless, unless it's zero. somebody just on a phone going like, yeah, so apparently uh, you're telling me the landing gear doesn't work? Okay, uh, tell everybody I love them. Uh, here's where I left the uh, spare key to the car. Yeah. That's, that's not really good. Okay. Uh, say goodnight, Blair. Yeah. Good night, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. I can't. Say good morning, good morning. Justin. Hey, good morning. Good morning, Justin. Good night, good Kiki. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks for watching. Thanks for joining. It was fun, and we can't wait to see you again next week. Good sciencing all weekend to you. If you're in the Bay Area, check out the Bay Area Science Festival because it's going on now. Events all around. See you later. Bye.
Oh yeah, there's so many buttons. 